everyone. Welcome uh, to this, the ninth meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. <clears throat> We're joined this morning uh, by Kenneth Gibson, who's uh, substituting for Joan McAlpine, and also Alex uh, Johnson, who's substituting for Annabelle Goldie. Uh, although you've been a member of the committee before, Alex, there are formalities we have to go through and we have to establish if you have any interest that you have to declare. Um, I... So far as I'm aware, I have no relevant interest required to be declared other than that I have previously been a member of this committee. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Um, can I also ask if everyone would please ensure that mobile phones or electronic devices are switched off before we start? And that brings us to agenda item one which is uh, an oral evidence session on the so-called bedroom tax. The committee has done a substantial amount of high-profile work on the bedroom tax and its mitigation through discretionary housing payments. The aim of today's session is to take stock of how the mitigation is working in practice and whether it's having the desired effect on the ground. <clears throat> Today, we're using a roundtable format for our discussions. This approach allows us to hear from a wider range of witnesses uh, in a short space of time. It's worked well for us in the past, and I hope that it will work again today. For the benefit of those in the public gallery or viewing online, I should point out that the roundtable format not only allows members to ask questions directly of those who have kindly given their time to come along this morning, but it encourages an interaction between everyone around the table. If witnesses want to ask questions themselves, make comments or bring points to the committee's attention, I welcome uh, them doing so. We will keep the discussion as fluid as possible in the time that we have available. However, I ask that all contributions from members of the committee and witnesses be made uh, one at a time and through me to ensure that everyone gets an opportunity to have their say. This will also allow to, uh, our broadcasting and official report staff to record the discussion. Um, we welcome before the committee this morning Alan Wiley. He's not with us yet, but we know he's on his way. He's a previous petitioner to the committee as part of the No to Bedroom Tax campaign. Scott Wilson, again, a previous Your Say witness to the committee who has been helpful to us in the past. Hannah McCulloch, Policy and Parliamentary Officer at the Child Poverty Action Group. Jeremy Hewer, Policy Advisor, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. Cliff Dryborough, the Benefits Manager, City of Edinburgh Council. Annette Finnan. Head of Area Services for Housing and South Lanarkshire Council, and Lorna Campbell, Service Manager, Revenues and Benefits at Dumfries and Galloway Council. So thanks very much to you all for giving your time this morning. Um, to get the ball rolling, um, to maybe get us into some of the issues, yesterday uh, a few members of the committee attended um, an event in a community centre in Nidri in Edinburgh. Um, we're looking at whole range of welfare issues. Uh, we were sitting at different tables, and the table that I was sitting at, two of the, the people who were there mentioned um, concerns around the way that the, the DHP um, was operating. Um, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations mentioned that same issue in their submission at, at point 0.215. Um, basically, what we were being told was that there, there appears to be a, uh, a situation developing where DHP is being diverted away from people who may previously have received it because officials who are administering the, the process are so focused on getting it to uh, people who have been affected by the bedroom tax. So can I come first of all to Jeremy then to say, is that your experience how difficult a problem is this, if it is becoming a problem, if, if you could give us an idea of what that is, and then if anyone else who has experience of that could let us know from their perspective what the position is. Jeremy? Well, thank you, Chair. I mean, we are getting one or two cases where the, this, the concern has been raised, whereas um, the SFHA w welcomes and appreciates the intervention of the Scottish Government and local authorities in fully mitigating in DHP. There are other areas of DHP uh, which give rise for concern. Um, to give some background, um, the DWP allocates a contribution towards discretionary housing payments and it does it under four headings. Uh, one is uh, the core, um, if you like, the traditional core issues for which DHP was always there for. One was for local housing allowance. 
One was for the benefit um, cap and one was for uh, bedroom tax removal, the spare room subsidy. Now, it kept, maintained, if you like, its allocation for uh, what its notional allocation for the spare room subsidy at 60 million, but then it cut quite considerably the um, allocations in the other areas. So overall, I think um, what had been the 2014-15 uh, uh, budget of about 165 million was reduced nationally to, uh, I think, 125 million. Um, and some and in addition to that, it recalculated the way some of that allocation was, was distributed. The net result is some authorities, a couple of authorities in Scotland did slightly better, but some authorities did worse, and most notably worse, was Glasgow that was hit by over a million pounds reduction in the DWP contribution. Um, now the concern is obviously that... Um, the desire is, is to try and fully mitigate the bedroom tax, but those other areas that um, had traditionally been uh, supported by DWP, um, particularly private sector tenants on, uh, to do with the local housing allowance, I think, uh, and, uh, and the core issues um, may be uh, losing out. And the, the concern is that, uh, as I said in, in our submission, um, in the feedback that we got from the associations when we made inquiries, they said that there had been a couple of cases where the claimants who'd been previously awarded a DHP had now either had their application for award turned down or reduced. Is there anyone else have any experience of this? Any protesters? In terms of the claims and awards made at South Lanarkshire Council last year, we made over 5,000 awards of DHP for the under-occupied element. But we did also manage to make over 1,600 awards for other categories. So there is a, a divide between the two elements that's having to be made and judged by benefit agencies and, and benefit departments within the councils. But there is still awards being made to that other group. In South Lanarkshire, we have streamlined the process in terms of DHP awards for under-occupancy, but we are still having to look at the criteria in terms of any other award, whether it be for, for benefit cap or other forms of hardship. So there is almost a test in terms of criteria that we're having to apply, but we have managed to still ma make awards for the other categories. This year, however, our DWP allowance in terms of DHP has gone down by over £100,000, that's 16%. Um, and we will have to see how far that goes. Kevin? Uh, just a brief uh, question for Mr. Hewer, uh, convener. I wonder if Mr. Hewer can maybe give us a, an indication um, of where those housing associations that have experienced difficulty actually are, because it, it may be a difficulty in certain <coughs> parts of the country and not in others, and I think it would be useful for us to know that. Um, if my memory serves me well, it um, I think it was um, housing associations in the north. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was either Aberdeen or Aberdeenshire. I think it would be maybe useful for us, convener, if we wrote to um, local authorities to, to find out how the element is split, because I think it's useful hearing from Ms Finnan, but it would be, I think, much better if we heard from every authority to see yeah. what was happening in this regard. Absolutely. Without identifying anyone, because one of the commitments we gave to people who attended yesterday was that they would remain anonymous, but I think it's safe to say that, given that we were based in uh, the, the event in Edinburgh, we were talking about issues relating to Edinburgh, so I think it may be fair to come to Cliff to ask if, uh, if, if he's got a take on this. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I kind of echo uh, what Annette is saying in South Lanarkshire. Certainly in 2014-15, we have seen no degradation in terms of numbers of awards for core DHP. In fact, if anything, it was up slightly on previous years. However, for 15-16, like South Lanarkshire, we have a cut of 165,000 around that core DHP. So our approach to it will be similar to Annette's and see how it goes. So we're actually motoring through all the under-occupancy and the benefit cap awards at the moment. And really after that, we'll probably be seeing what we have left. And we might have to do some policy tailoring depending on what we have left. But as I say, 14, 15, no, not, I didn't see any degradation in Edinburgh. Yeah. Yeah. 
It, it, it was just a, a, a quick question because my um, understanding is that the bedroom tax has been completely mitigated and the payment is there. So is it people's understanding that these pressures on discretionary housing payments would have been there regardless of the because of the cuts from DWP? Jeremy? Um, I'm, I'm afraid it's a bit more complex because although the DWP, if you like, allocates a certain amount uh, for discretion under various headings, you, there's no hard and fast rule that you've got to, if you like, rigidly follow those headings at all. Because obviously uh, one of the headings is um, the benefit cap. And in Scotland that isn't such a big issue as it is um, you know, uh, within the M25 circle where um, well over half of all benefit cap cases are. So it, it, it's, it's not that... Um, you, you can't sort of, uh, sort of say uh, exactly what... I think the real concern is, was the um, recalculation of the core element of, of uh, discretionary housing payments, and they've changed it to a sort of um, a, a fairly basic pro rata um, per head basis. And that's why um, authorities such as Glasgow lost out very, very badly. But am I right in saying that that was going to happen anyway, whether the bedroom tax element of that had been mitigated or not by the Scottish Government? Um, it's, it's hard. I, I, I couldn't say for, uh, for certain. I mean, one of the arguments is, is that um, the, um, the Westminster government was going to reduce its overall allocation for DHPs anyway. It was seen to be a transitional, um, a, a transitional arrangement. Now, because of some of the cases that came up before the, 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 the higher courts... Um, ..where there was an argument that, um, you know, that... that, that um, the bedroom tax was an infringement of human rights. The, 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 um, a lot of the court's decisions, um, paraphrasing, was that it may have been discriminatory, but there was discretionary housing payments to mitigate for that, and therefore, um, the, uh, if you like, the uh, appellants lost and, and, and the government won. But the quid pro quo of that was that uh, the government would have to maintain a, a fairly high... or. Um, than a higher allocation of DHP than it, than it uh, originally perhaps wanted to, in order to, um, you know, to if you are, ab avoid the litigation side of it. Okay. Lorna? I think um, probably an answer to that as well, that given the other welfare cuts that have, have come in, the demand for DHP, we have seen an increase. I mean, similar to some other colleagues from other local authorities, we have... I would say fully mitigated bedroom tax, 97% of the 3% would try to contact. It's a, a lack of contact or tenants coming to us, uh, that fall down. But we've spent DHP on another 1,000 tenants out with the bedroom tax, but the demand is higher there. I mean, obviously, for myself in Dumfries and Galloway, we, we had a, an uplift because of the rural element, so we had a... Um, it's a generous element of DHP, but we've had sufficient DHP to meet the demand um, for 2014 and 2013. Going forward, like my other two colleagues, with the demand, it still is high and likely to become higher with universal credit um, being implemented um, from April this year. Um, the expectation for DHP is, is going to remain high in local authorities and our ability to meet that with the reduced funds um, it is going to come under pressure. Yeah. One of the other issues that was raised yesterday, <clears throat> and again, some of the, the submissions we've already had from uh, witnesses this morning, alluded to the fact that the, the cost of having to go through an application process is, you know, can be uh, problematic and is drawing resources away from other budgets. Um, could we get a sense of, of how that's happening, why it's happening? Sure, we certainly noted in the submission the impact that the processing of DHP and the, the enhanced level of engagement and contact we're trying to make with our tenants affected has had on our, our, on our budgets. The, the commitment to fully mitigate um, the bedroom tax through the additional funds from the Scottish Government certainly helped to streamline our processes. There's no doubt about that. We changed our policy, we changed our processes and how we administer DHP. Um, 
but we still have to process that massive increase in DHP claims, as well as try and contact almost 5,000 people who are affected. Um, again, we're being very proactive in terms of how we contact our tenants affected, and we're working really closely with our housing association partners as well. But we have brought on a team um, known as the Benefits Are Changing Team locally, with 10 officers who have now been in post for almost a year and a half to two years. We increased our staff in processing DHPs by additional three staff, and we've also provided additional staff to local housing offices in terms of trying to manage the rent arrears, um, which initially increased particularly. So there has been a real burden um, placed on, I think, local authorities in trying to not only administer and process, but contact tenants and provide that very necessary help and support in terms of whether it's help with welfare reform or other forms of hardship, so that there is a, a pressure on budgets at a time when they're being cut. Kevin. Um, convener, obviously um, some pressures, but we have the mitigation from the Scottish Government, which I think we're all grateful for, and certainly um, having been round the doors quite a bit of late, um, I think that some families certainly would not have been able to cope without that. Um, but we're about to face a budget in July where a government has said that it's looking for £12 billion worth of further welfare cuts. <coughs> what would happen um, to you guys and to the folks out there if Westminster withdrew its uh, payments of, towards DHP? What would the cost be if it was decided that DHP, their, their payment towards DHP was one of the cuts that took place in the 12 billion that we're going to see withdrawn? I think one of the, the, the biggest impacts would be on people's ability to, to make that shortfall. Um, the DHP is allowing that shortfall to, in, in housing benefit to be made up. If that finance isn't available, the burden will either fall back on the local authority to try and increase the budget and or have an increased bad debt provision in terms of potential rent arrears and, and people's inability to meet their, their housing costs. Would it also have uh, a detriment in terms of uh, your council being able to invest in the housing stock and maybe build even more council houses? I think we've articulated in our submission that um, the potential impact on council budgets will therefore impact on service provision, whether that be staffing, whether it be our ability to invest and repair our stock, or to have our capital programmed, which are financed via our, our housing account, in terms of new build and other major investments to meet um, the, the new housing standards in terms of each, etc. That will have an impact if we are seeing further pressures placed onto councils, particularly the housing department's budget. So it would be fair to say that if the uh, UK government chose to take that route, it wouldn't only have a, an effect on those folks in, who are currently in receipt of DHPs for various reasons. It would have an effect uh, on everyone, uh, basically, who is reliant on these services that the council provides. I think just to add, uh, we have articulated in our submission, we no doubt think there would be an impact on council services. Thank you. I wonder if Mr Hewer could respond from a housing association <coughs> point of view, Convener. Um, obviously, I think um, it, it would have a, a very detrimental in, in impact on, on our tenants. And I think the real concern, and I think it was highlighted in some of the submissions that, that were given to the committee prior to um, this meeting, is, um, you know, um, bedroom tax mitigation and three DHPs, it, it's a great expedient and it's done a lot, but there are a group of folk who, um, because they're not entitled to housing benefits and not entitled to DHPs, and one of the um, suggested cuts that the uh, Westminster government is thinking of is removing the entitlement to housing benefit to young people. Under, under the age of 25. Obviously, if they're not entitled to housing benefit, technically they wouldn't be entitled to dis discretionary housing payments. So obviously the impact on them um, would be even more acute. I wonder if Mr Driver I could respond for Edinburgh too. I think it depends on the scale of the cut to the DHP pot. 
uh, if I turn the clock back two years before we had the mitigation fundings and, and the top-ups uh, back to, you know, uh, say, around the 1st of April 2013, I was sitting in Edinburgh with a pot from the DWP of around 1.3, 1.4 million, and our policy reflected that ability to spend. In other words, the Council wasn't going to top up that pot, so that's all we had. <clears throat> so our policy included looking at luxuries. <clears throat> Excuse me. So basically, a DHP would have been awarded for six months uh, through an income and expenditure statement. And perhaps at the end of that six months under review, if um, certain standards of living hadn't changed within the income and expenditure statement, we may not have awarded any further DHP because we didn't have any further funds to award. Um, now, that, that luxuries paragraph still stays in our policy today. So if, we, if, if funds were cut back you know, to a large extent, we may have to fall back to that policy in the first instance um, as a way of saying that's all the money we have. Uh, therefore, if you don't um, reduce some of the luxuries, potentially, that are, and I'm not using this as a widespread thing, just saying this is where we were two years ago, uh, that would be our first port of call. If uh, it was bigger than that and the pot got absolutely decimated, then the council would have to have a hard think does it have any funds at all, or what other services would suffer? Uh, you know, infrastructure, staffing, any other services around filling that hole in DHP? Anna, what did you want to convene? Um, it was just, just to note, really, that um, even without further additional welfare cuts, um, welfare cuts are already happening in terms of changing um, the way family benefits are uprated from year to year will have a cumulative effect. Even though these aren't housing-specific benefits, they'll affect family budgets and, in turn, ability to, to cover housing costs. So it's not just additional cuts or changes to LHA or, or changes to non-dependent deductions, for instance, housing-related reforms. It's general fall in the value of benefits will affect low-income families and lead to, to more pressure on DHPs as people can't cover their housing costs. Christina? It's just very quick for me to thank you very much to come in on Follow up on point, and my colleague Kevin has said, and in some of the points that local authorities have said, but it'll probably tie into what, where Hannah is going with in, in her submission as well. And it was on this issue about the changes to support for people under 25. Now, I know in my constituency, a lot of people I know that are under 25 that are struggling and have young families as well, and that's that whole impact. And uh, recently, I, I had a meeting with the Executive Director of um, Social Work in South Lanarkshire, who um, said to me there was a great worry there about the impact on the consequential impact on other services like you know, child protection, like the child uh, poverty um, strategy that they've got, like housing allocation, the ability to you know, pay your rent, and all of that. And I just wondered whether any of the local authorities had you know, tentatively, I know that it's early days, done any modelling on that and what that modelling was telling them. And I know that the Child Poverty Action Group had done, had done some work on that and whether you know, they could enlighten us and uh, what, what, what we, we would expect and then, obviously, the consequential impact on any housing benefit payment or any you know, universal credit or any uh, benefit payments that goes to that family. Okay. Lorna? Um, we've not done any specific modelling <coughs> on number 25. Obviously, we're aware of our housing benefit caseload at the moment and who and it be easy to extract that. I mean, you're, 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 you're um, obviously correct, and you know, we've got, had conversations with our social work services department who are already facing increased pressures with families who are... Um, feeling the, the, the impacts of the welfare cuts um, just now. Um, we've also spoken to our RSLs as a, as a stock transfer authority. We don't have our own housing stock. So our, our main RSL, who is our stock transfer authority, has already expressed concerns to us that their rent arrears for last year, despite um, the increased DHP awards they had generally overall, had gone up by 300,000, and that they're particularly vulnerable to changes in their debt. Um, so they, they're significantly concerned about their future um, if there is further impacts um, on, on welfare cuts. Yeah. Jeremy, you wanted to add something? Well, I would say that obvi obviously if, if, if there was any reduction and there was a consequent increase in arrears, um, it would create sp specific challenges for housing associations because, um, if you like, the borrowing that they have 
um, acquired in order to invest in their housing and to build housing is based on assumptions of, of rental income streams. And if they can't make, um, you know, match those assumptions, the, the lenders will come back and say, well, sorry, I think we're going to have to renegotiate our covenant, which probably means an increased cost. And that increased cost would obviously um, affect, probably uh, re be reflected in increased rents throughout um, the, the whole stock, you know, to not only those who are dependent on housing benefit or, or universal credit, but the, the, um, anyone who, any tenant of the, of the association would be adversely affected. Clear. Yeah. Thank you. It's moving on to that point. Yep. Is that okay? Um, yep. um, well, to come back to something, Mr. Did you, can, um, can you wait there? Just yep, kind of sure. to give in yep. on something on that mm -hmm. point. Point. Oh, I, I actually, from Jeremy, and it was just through. The, I know that uh, uh, South Lanarkshire on their submission talked about. You know, the, uh, they, they said, and I quote, the complex arrangements involved in identifying and managing rent arrears for households affected. The, uh, the under-occupancy rules had also adversely impacted on rent arrears more generally. And I was just wondering if uh, if, if Jeremy uh, and indeed. Uh, uh, um, um, you know, um, Annette could could comment a wee bit more about that, about the general effect on renters, as we were as we were uh, just, just touching on that issue. Certainly, initially, um, almost two years ago, you know, the impact on rent arrears was uh, significant. Um, we saw an immediate rise in rent arrears of households affected by the welfare, welfare reform changes that were brought in. We have been able to reverse some of that trend. Um, I think when I gave evidence in November 2013, over 70% of our tenants who were affected by the bedroom tax had some form of arrear. That has significantly reduced now to just over 30%. And those tenants who have arrears that are solely relating to the, the reduction in, the, in their housing benefit due to the bedroom tax is now at 7%. So we've seen a significant a reduction in arrears that relate to this change. However, we have still experienced uh, increased arrears overall as households are affected by other um, changes to their income, um, to their benefits and, and, are, and are experiencing hardship. So it remains a challenge, although probably only through the increased funding for DHP have we been able to reverse that significant trend in arrears. But again, that's been by putting the resources in to try and engage with the tenants affected um, to ensure that they're applying um, in our simplified way for DHP and that we're getting that into people's accounts. Okay, thank you. Jeremy? Um, we're still waiting um, uh, the um, Scottish Housing Regulator um, data for the financial year just gone, but certainly... Um, there was an increase in rent arrears, overall in, increase in rent arrears um, between 2012-13 um, and 2013-14, uh, if you like, the year before the introduction of the bedroom tax and the, and the year after. I think it went up from 3.3% overall to 4.3% overall. The impression that we get from associations is, is that they have coped with, with, with the arrears situation and certainly when the full mitigation uh, came in, uh, in, in the financial year just gone, um, I think there was a, a sort of a collective sigh of relief, and I think it um, f folk felt uh, much more positive. But I think what perhaps we haven't picked, um, really assessed is the increased resources that have gone in from landlords uh, in rent connection in terms of uh, and other mitigation work. I mean, we've also, uh, a number of associations have been very, very lucky to get money uh, from the Making Advice Work project that was um, administered by the Scottish Le Legal Aid Board. So in terms of, of improving the, the quality of advice and accessibility to advice um, that tenants could have and, and to help them through, um, you know, to make the best of, of, of the resources that they have has, has had a, a positive impact. But you're always wondering at the back of your mind, how long can that survive? How long can that last? That, that, that you know, people are being stretched. If they got into debt, they may have borrowed from friends and family, and those resources may no longer be there. You know, that if, if, if you like, you, you've reached the limit, and, and um, the real worry is, is that it's all going to come crashing down on, on a personal level. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Emil. You wanted to come on a point. 
Roy yes, it was around allocations. I mean, Christina just briefly touched on allocations. So, McGregor well, since we've already discussed it, before bringing something different in from mm -hmm. Clare, if you want to carry on with that point then. Okay, then. It was really just to ask uh, what's happening in regards to allocations because we've had evidence that housing providers are still provide, you know, they're still reluctant to allocate properties where households are, you know, then going to be under occupying. And I just wondered if there was any evidence around that from the local authorities or uh, from SFHA, um, because we've had evidence, for example, from Women's Aid that women are still being kept, you know, being held longer in refuges because, um, you know, they, there's no one-bedroom properties to offer them. And it's this shortage of one-bedroom properties that's causing a real problem. And it would seem that some local authorities are uh, using discretionary housing benefit to allow women to, to get a two-bedroom property, for example, uh, and use the DHP, but that's not consistent across all local authorities. So it was really just to get some um, feedback on that. Um, Jeremy. We've had anecdotal evidence back that, um, if you like, the turnover of properties is not necessarily because um, the housing association has been saying, no, we don't want to let this to you because you may be liable for the bedroom tax. It's more the, the tenant, the applicant, saying, um, I would prefer not to have such a larger property in case I'm, I'm hit with a bedroom tax in, in the future. So there has been, if you like, um, a slowing down of, of throughput and some associations are, have reported that they have found it more difficult. It's taken a bit more time to uh, allocate and let the, the, their larger properties. Yeah, so the void figures are going up then, you know. Um, not I'm not sure if they're, they're going up, but certainly the turnover time I think is, is lengthening on, on those larger properties. I mean, there's still obviously, um, you know, I, there is an overall shortfall in housing, um, but um, I think people are, um, you know, are <clears throat> being much more thoughtful about um, the property, you know, the, the commitments that they take on. Mm -hmm. And is that the same for local authorities? Certainly in South Lanarkshire, we have not made any change to our allocation policy in terms of the occupancy standard that applicants can apply for, and it is their choice. Um, single people and couples can apply for and wait for a one or a two bedroom property, and we've not changed that <coughs> due to the bedroom tax. But we do see applicants choosing to wait for the property size that best matches their household in terms of what benefit they will qualify for. So. I, I couldn't say how many, but there's certainly there is a trend in that happening. Um, we've not seen any detrimental effect on our avoid um, management processes, on how long it takes to allocate a property. But what we have seen is real pressure for the smaller properties that we do have. We experienced an 18% drop in turnover generally in the last 12 months. And when only 25% of our stock is one bedrooms anyway, then that makes a big cut in the, the, that particular size of house to meet um, those who are on our waiting list. Couples and single people form over 60% of those on our housing list anyway. So it, it is a real pressure for smaller properties. But we haven't changed our policy and, and couples and single people can still access a one or a two bedroom. Mm -hmm. Lorna, you wanted to come yes. in? We have our, our four main RSLs have a, a common allocations policy, um, and it has been adapted to reflect um, size need for a family. But the RSLs are still reporting that they will allocate a property larger than if that's what the tenant is looking for, and we're covering it with, with DHP if there's a shortfall. But what, again, our main RSL is reporting back to us that they do have a, 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 a build-up of large three-bedroom properties, especially in, especially in the remote rural areas um, that they're finding very difficult to let as people are wary of taking properties larger because of the potential of being hit with a bedroom tax mm -hmm. somewhere down the line. So it is beginning to cause a problem um, in some other areas. Yeah. I mean, it might be prudent to include that in the letter that we're going to write to all local yeah. authorities then, That's just ask them fair point, Margaret, what the effect is on their allocations. Yeah. Cliff? <coughs> in Edinburgh... Um, around the, the things that are going on to, to try and uh, make people move to mainly smaller properties. There 
There is a council tenant incentive scheme package there to try and incentivise people down, but also conversely, it, uh, it can work up the way if required. There is a housing exchange uh, policy there that in includes council or housing associations, and the housing layout uh, plans <coughs> are being amended, uh, you know, in the in the build programme going forward to include more one-bedroom properties but also with the flexibility of making them convertible to two-bedroom if, if required. Now, I'm guessing that's not very much different from what a lot, a lot of the other local authorities are, are actually doing to try and gain more flexibility in the whole piece. Okay. Yeah. Just on a particular point, uh, and again in the net submission, she touched on a, something very similar. I mean, I'm just wondering what the... What numbers are we talking about? I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, South Lanarkshire, for example, have talked about you know very similar things, such as a letting initiative to help tenants move to small properties, uh, a promotion of online mutual exchange service, and uh, inclusion of one-bedroom properties in the new house building programme. But what, what scale are we actually talking about, and what has been the impact relative to the the the, the, the number of households affected by the bedroom tax in, in each of your local authorities? So we, we um, referenced in our submission that we did introduce a lightning initiative to help support anyone who was wishing to move to a smaller property, um, whether it be from a three to a two bedroom or two to a one bedroom, it, it didn't matter. And we have afforded that priority to applicants who apply. At the end of December last year, we only had 50 applicants on our, our priority list wishing to move to a smaller property for this reason. Um, and of those offered properties, smaller properties last year, only nine accepted an offer to a smaller property. So while we've got almost 5,000 people affected, there's a very small number are choosing to move, um, probably because their costs have been met through DHP. And of those who are on the list as a safeguard, there's a small number actually choosing to, to make that actual move at a time when they can. So um, DHP has certainly helped helping households remain in their home and is not forcing them to, to move. But we have that in place if, if anyone does want to. So, sorry, Cliff, is that experience in Edinburgh as well? So. I don't have any exact numbers with yeah. me, but given you know, in my submission I did say that our spend on the under-occupancy element had gone up in 14-15, mm -hmm. then clearly there isn't a significant downshift identifiable from these schemes, probably as Annette says, because the costs are being met. Okay. Was there, was there, were things different before the costs were being fully met? I mean, was there, was there more interest before there was full mitigation in terms of moving? Or was it similar that many people were just didn't want to move? I mean, yeah. I, well, I mean, clearly the the majority of cases <coughs> are in the in the council council stock. Um, I couldn't honestly comment back to the previous. Okay. Um, Claire, you wanted to introduce us. Well, it, it was just to come back on something that um, uh, Mr. Driver said earlier, uh, and it, I suppose it's the use of language that kind of jumped out and concerned me quite a bit. My, my eight years as an elected representative, the idea of luxury for people that are appealing to Christian housing payments is that they live as a bit of far away from luxury as I could. So I just wondered if we could get in records examples of some of the things that are subjectively being looked at for families. Uh, well, I think. Uh, what I, what I tried to say was um, we're not at that point at the moment, but we might have to be at that point in the future if DHP allocations were cut either you know, by 50% or 100%. That's what we'd have to look at if the council couldn't find the money to top up. And uh, we were, you know, there basically was no money left. That's what we'd have to do. We've not had to do that up until now. Could I have some examples of what would that be things like if somebody had to pay, it, for instance? Oh, right. Um, I guess. <laughs> Just trying to get to the bottom okay. of what uh, would be. I guess, you know, as I say, it's an income and expenditure statement mm -hmm. you'd be looking at. But perhaps, as an example, you might um, be looking at the television provision around maybe Sky, say, or something like that. or or any, any aspect of an income and expenditure statement. Uh, you know, uh, lifestyle, lifestyle statements. Anna? Just thought it was worth highlighting in our evidence. We, we have a case, it's actually a, 
a benefit cap case where a, f a family with four children had been moved to temporary accommodation um, because they were fleeing domestic violence. Um, they'd hit the benefit cap, essentially, and their, their housing benefit had been reduced substantially. And at looking at their application for discretionary housing payment, they were given uh, an award for three months, but they were told it was unlikely to be extended because of their spending. Their spending on electricity was larger than average, but bearing in mind it was a, a, a family with four children, um, and that one of the children was being counselled um, as a result of the experience of um, fleeing violence, and that as well was, was seen as ex excessive. So it, that's a one-off off case, but there are some worrying implications of, of that. Thank you. C C Convener, can I just ask for Hannah to clarify there? Somebody being counselled because they have seen domestic violence and been part of uh, a situation which has involved domestic violence. Counselling, where does that come into play? Surely that is, is a necessity and, you know, were they paying for that counselling because they couldn't get it um, from the local authority or others? I, I, I mean, I, I just don't understand that and I think it's absolutely ridiculous if that counselling was seen as a luxury in any way, shape or form. I can send... I only have a, a small note of the case that's in the, um, the written submission, but I can look into that and get further details. But as far as I remember, it was that she was paying privately for counselling for her child, and that was being, certainly being taken into account. Although, as I said, the DHP was awarded for, for three months. But I'll, I can send further details. Thank you. Yeah. Hannah alluded to the fact that their submission gave us some cases that, that we could look at. We actually have a live case uh, sitting with us, uh, Scott Wilson, who's been through the process. Scott, do you want to give us your experience and, and tell us how you feel about the, the process? Hi, uh, my name's Scott Wilson and I gave evidence to the Welfare Reform Committee back in September 2013 in relation to the bedroom tax. I was diagnosed with younger onset Parkinson's disease eight years ago and as most of you know it's a degenerative disease so I'm never going to get better but I'm only going to get worse and my very uncomfortable, sometimes painful symptoms are aggravated by stress and anxiety, etc. And if I've got to worry about trying to pay £40.76 every four weeks from my benefits just now, I'd hate to think how I'd be health-wise, how it would affect me. Since I last gave evidence, I contacted South Lancashire Council regarding help with DHP and I've nothing but praise for them and the way their staff handled my queries of the DHP. They dealt with it all and I was awarded the £10.19 per week of DHP. I would like to see the government take notice of the needy, poor and disabled people that this medieval style tax is enforced on and see it abolished before the Scottish Government can no longer afford to subsidise it and put people into debt through no fault of their own. A very strong comment and certainly reflects what we heard yesterday uh, when we were taking evidence um, at Nidri. I'm just wondering, one of the people who spoke to us yesterday is someone else who'd gone through the, the process and what they were concerned about was that although, again, they had you know, nothing but praise for the, the local authority that, that had supported them, they were still in arrears and having to work with the local authority try, to try and resolve that problem. Is that your experience? Are you aware of other people that you've spoken to who might be in that subject and then opening it up to others? How wide a problem is the residual arrears from the, the first year when the mitigation wasn't in place? Uh, personally, I think, yeah, there will be a lot of people that have had to deal with arrears regarding uh, until they got DHP sorted out because my experience to start off with I didn't really know much about DHP until I came here and gave evidence so it wasn't really out there for the public knowledge it was more or less kind of in the background if you didn't ask for it you didn't get it you didn't get the help for it yeah. representatives of local authorities are, are you still dealing with arrears is that still an ongoing problem and how are you dealing with it since the funding for DHP was increased last year and again for this year, we have fully mitigated um, the bedroom tax through DHP for all of our tenants who have engaged with us. So I think we reflected, we think 99% of it has been mitigated. 
for the very small number who have not got a DHP, then it's either because they're a relatively new applicant and we are trying to process applications as quickly as we can. We contact people affected within five working days is what we're aiming to do. Or it's, it's, it's tenants who, through multiple contacts, despite them, we still haven't uh, engaged with us. So very, very small numbers within South Lanarkshire have an arrear now that relates to the bedroom tax. We have households who have a, a small arrear that relates to the bedroom tax or none, but have other arrears, and we are managing them sensitively through our, our rent arrears processes. Um, in terms of arrears that might have accrued prior to the increased funding, then our local authority has effectively backdated DHP to cover any shortfall through the bedroom tax uh, and mitigated, as I say, fully um, any, any shortfall for those who have engaged with us. Okay. Has that been possible for every other local authority or are there, are there still sizable numbers out there or is it a small number that just needs to be addressed? Um, well, for, for Edinburgh, we're at about 97%. Uh, so there's probably around 150 people there that have just not engaged, albeit we've tried all the different mediums of engagement, uh, whether it be email, phones, um, visiting team, uh, and continue to try and contact. Uh, we, we even engaged with the, uh, the Lothian uh, Anti-Bedroom Tax Federation. We had them in and spoke to them and, and you know, encouraged them to, to make contact because I, I think my, you know, we've said about the widening the eligibility and speed of award very much moved to an intent to apply. So if somebody contacts and says, we'd like to apply for DHP uh, to, uh, for under occupancy, that's all they have to, that's all they have to do. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, but we need that, we need at least that to be able to award. But it's sim simply that, that one sentence. So we put that message out to the, because quite often, if, in my experience, if local authorities getting in touch, they, not everybody will respond because they maybe think it's about rent arrears. Or, so by trying to engage you know, a third party, a third sector, um, we seem to get our percentage up a bit. Yeah. Anecdotally, I've, I've heard people saying that as well, but the fact that you're the landlord, people don't like to deal with their landlord when they're talking about arrears to their landlord. Jeremy, is that the...? It, um if you like, the arrears situation has been kept uh, well under control through um, strenuous efforts at, at engagement and, and ensuring that um, there's maximum take-up in income maximisation. Some authority, um, associations have reported that they were fortunate enough to get full mitigation in the previous financial year um, before the full mitigation, the 2013-14 um, um, year. Um, because the, the, there were resources available with some local authorities, some weren't, weren't so lucky. Um, as, I think as time goes on as well, it, the, the, if you like, the, the, the distinction between um, what were bedroom tax arrears and what were not um, other arrears uh, has become blurred and, and it depends on how sophisticated the individual housing association's uh, housing management system is because it, they, they weren't, weren't originally designed to distinguish between one kind of arrear and another. Yeah. Is it not, I, I've heard submissions, I heard people mention it again yesterday, and I think some of the, the uh, submissions we had this morning suggested that a non-application system would be more effective and would reduce some of the, the bureaucracy. Is there something about DHP that prevents there being a non-application system, do you have to go through this bu bureaucracy and miss out on 150 or so people mm. um, in order to, to, to use DHP? Would it, or is there another way that you can use DHP that, that is not requiring of an application? I have heard some associations say that if they apply for the DHP, it, 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 the, the consideration, but technically it has to be the claimant that has to apply for it. And there are some claimants, um, uh, tenant claimants, who um, I think even if told there's free money, um, mm. 
are very reluctant to engage for one reason or other, whether it's fear, whether it's actually a principal stand against the, the actual idea of the bedroom tax in the first place or whatever, mm. um, that, um, that they haven't wanted to engage um, with, with, with the association or, or the local authority. Yeah. This, this is something that I've certainly brought up with the Minister before because it's been brought to me by local authorities who have said mm. that they would prefer to have a system mm. where, because you all know yeah. uh, who is affected by the bedroom tax, so there's 100% knowledge yes. of those who are impacted, but even at 99% or 97% uh, of distribution of the funds to those who have applied, that still means that there are people missing out. Although you know who those people are, mm. you have to get them to apply. And yes. you know, we, we seriously need to look at a way of, of having a non-application system so that if someone's identified as um, falling foul of mm. the, the under-occupancy rule, that they receive the, the support because the, the finances has been put there to cover that individual, but they're mm. not receiving the money. Mm. It just seems to be a, a bureaucratic uh, obstacle that needs to be addressed. I just wonder if you have any views on how that can be done? Well, ideally, I mean, if, if you like, discretionary housing payments were always seen as an expedient. You know, it, it was, if you like, making the best of a bad job. Um, and ideally, you would not actually have, uh, you would have a system in that, that, that a, you didn't have um, the, the business of the removal of the spare room subsidy, or you would, you would have a system where you could actually um, if you like, intervene. And in fact, certainly with the rollout of universal credit, it's, it's going to be much, much more complicated because at least at the moment, um, if you like, those who are calculating the housing benefit and those who are calculating the DHPs are one and the same organisation and therefore it's relatively seamless. When we get um, universal credit in, obviously um, the challenge certainly for housing associations will be that they will have to deal with both the DWP uh, in terms of, 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 if you like, the core housing costs and apply to the, the local authority for the discretionary housing payment and apply to the tenant for any contribution that they have to uh, make in their own right, uh, which is going to be a crazy system, um, particularly in terms of, of actually reconciling it because if, if local authorities may be, um, if, if I'm right, may be working on a fortnightly or four-weekly basis, the DWP will be working on a calendar monthly basis and actually sort of making sure that you've got, um, the, 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 if you like, that all the rent has been paid and, uh, and it's been reconciled um, will be quite a headache. And also the manual systems that are coming in um, with, with universal credit uh, and, the, if you like, the, um, the, the infrastructure that, that the uh, DWP are having to use gives um, very grave uh, cause for concern. I mean, I don't know if you were able to see the, um, the report of the Public Accounts Committee um, that came out um, fairly recently, but if, if I may quote from it, um, it, it noted that it said, the department has used 100% manual checking of live service payments at, ver at various points in the past, and it had to reintroduce 100% checks in June 2014 because of problems created by a software update. The department told us that if we had to carry out full manual checking on every case as live service expands across the country, the program would be um, almost unaffordable. Now, to have 100% live checking of at that time was probably about 12,000 cases was a task. Now they're boasting that they've got well over 50,000 coming up to 60,000 cases and probably would th if the national expansion c completes um, April next year, I suppose nationally there may be a couple of hundred thousand people, uh, single claimants on universal credit. If they've got to manually check all those I really don't know what, 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 what is going to happen and obviously the knock-on effect um, in terms of housing costs, benefit delays and things like that, it's going to cause huge problems for local authorities, for landlords and, and indeed for the private rented sector. Okay. Alex, well, then Christina and then Kevin. Uh, uh, Kevin, for people who haven't got the chance, I'll come back to you. But yeah. Alex, then Christina and then Kevin. Uh, on the issue of non-engagement, the, there is, we're aware, uh, a 
a genuine problem with non-engagement with the benefit system uh, across the board. Particular people will not engage and get into quite serious areas of hardship as a result. Is the issue of non-engagement in relation to the under-occupancy charge greater, or is it simply the same uh, proportion of non-engagement that we experience across the benefit system? Um, I wouldn't have information on, on, on whether it's, it's, it's the same or different, but I would imagine it's, it's um, on, on a similar scale. Mm. Thank you. I, th I think, if, if you like, non-engagement is, is a ge general issue rather than a DHP specific issue. Mm. Okay. Christina? Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Convener. It was, it was to pick up a point that, that, that Jeremy made, um, and I think Jeremy hit the, the nail on the head and Mr Wilson hammered at home. And as much as we um, appreciate the mitigation that's put into place, the actual system doesn't work. It doesn't support people in need. And although you've had a, a great experience at, at South Lanarkshire Council, um, which I can say, you know, the recent cases I've had worked very closely with the executive director, they've worked very, very well. The need to abolish is much, much more pertinent than the need to mitigate and work with a, an already damaged and, and, and you know, non-functioning system. And the Smith Commission has offered us some um, way out for that. The Devolution and Further Powers Committee last week you know, you know, published a report that suggested that that didn't go far enough and it wasn't beholden to the this, this spirit. What, what I think my question is, is, is how you know, would the professionals in the field who are doing the great work to support people like Mr Wilson, what kind of system would you like to see? And does Smith go far enough? What would you like to see in this Scotland Bill that's coming forward in a few weeks' time to address all of these issues? We're, we're agreed the system doesn't work. We either replace the system with something that works or try and fix the system we've got now. And we've been tinkering at fixing it for years with all sorts of mitigation schemes that, that are very, very welcome, as I said, but don't address the underlying problem here of helping people in need. And you got the magic bullet. <laughs> I think, um, from, from my perspective, is, you know, working at the professional end of it, is that DHP was always intended, that the legislation was written, that it was a temporary measure temporary. to... to sort a temporary problem. It was never intended as a long-term solution. So using it as a solution to mitigate the, the impacts of bedroom tax, it, it just means it's administration. And it's not just the application, it's the changes and the, and the, the maintenance of that. So uh, probably to agree to some degree is if to mitigate it, it is get rid of it at, at legislation level. Um, and then we don't need this administration on top of it and trying to get in contact with tenants or trying to get people to participate or contact local authorities. You would just you know, remove that altogether if that was the, the desired outcome. Yeah. OK. Kevin. Give me there. I want to go back to the points that um, Mr Hewer made. And I'm interested in the um, letter that uh, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations received from Neil Cooling, the Director General of Universal Credit, who um, this committee is uh, aware of. Uh, and in his letter, he uh, says that uh, we believe the system is safe and secure. Um, do uh, our witnesses today believe that that system um, is safe and secure? I should ask Mr Hewer first, since the letter was addressed to the Federation. Oh, I think our reaction to uh, reading that letter was, I write. Um, no, I don't think it's safe and secure. Um, I think there are serious doubts, um, certainly about the system, um, if you like, the dual the dual approach that um, the DW take, uh, DWP are taking to um, the introduction of universal credit with a, a digital system that is being trialled at the moment in Sutton, which I think is going to be expanded to Croydon um, very shortly, um, has yet to be proven. Um, the existing system certainly seems to be flaky and ever so dependent on manual recalculations. Um, so safe and secure, for the, bearing in mind that they're just doing this, the most straightforward cases at the moment that they think they can do, 
uh, you might get away with it. But certainly when you're having more complex cases come through, when you're starting to introduce it for couples and for families, um, I think you're, you're going to have problems. I mean, I think in some ways there may have been some benefits. I mean, there is some indication that certainly um, perhaps those in work who are on universal, uh, uh, who, who are eligible for universal credit, it may be beneficial to them compared to the existing legacy systems. But I can't honestly um, put my hand on the, you know, from what I have seen and what I have read, uh, I do not think it's a robust and resilient system. Hannah? So uh, this doesn't relate directly to universal credit, but I just had one eye on, on the clock. One of the things that came up when I was looking to submit this evidence was that there seems to be a group of people for whom um, the impact of the bedroom tax is not being mitigated at all. Um, and those are people who, once the, the bedroom tax is applied to their eligible rent, um, the, their, their rent for the purpose of the housing benefit calculation is reduced and is, is therefore seen as being affordable. They're therefore not eligible for housing benefit as a result of, of that being applied and um, as a result of not being eligible for housing benefit are not eligible to apply for discretionary housing payment. And we have a few cases like these and it's, it's not minuscule amounts of money. It's, it can be you know, 10, 15 pounds a week that people are having to cover out of their own pocket. Um, and as I say, we only have one or two cases, but I was just keen to draw it to the committee's attention and find out fr from others whether that's a, a significant problem. Okay. Is, is there any evidence? Are, are local authority colleagues aware of, of that? Certainly in our area, but it's not a significant problem. Or it's certainly a, it been brought to my attention. I'm aware of uh, at least two, three cases in our local area um, but that is, um, has been an impact, um, but it's, it's not huge as far as I'm aware. Okay. Margaret, you wanted to come in with a, a point? Yes, it was around, uh, you know, that issue, and, and Christina brought up the issue <coughs> around the devolved powers. I, because in CPAG's uh, submission, they, they say that draft clause, current, draft clause 9 currently states that the power can only be used for providing financial assistance to individuals who are entitled to housing benefit or any other reserve benefit payable in respect of a liability to make rent payments. So unless this clause is changed, uh, the Scottish Government will be unable to fully mitigate the impact of bedroom tax uh, until the rollout of universal credit is complete. And that could take up to four years, which is, you know, 2019. So, I mean, and all, the other issue is um, how long the actual devolved powers will take, that whole process. You know, so no one really knows that. So there is a real concern there. And uh, as Hannah has rightly pointed out, we need to be able to help these people who now find themselves in the position where they don't qualify for housing benefit because it has been lowered. And uh, we need to be able to do something about that. But currently, um, the powers, the devolved powers, are they, well, they're, they're mentioned, but they're not actually going to be able to uh, implement them because of the other issues around universal credit. Yeah. Mr. Whaley, I think you have a point on that. You've had a look at this type of issue, the housing benefit impact. Do you want to give us a view from your groups? Well, first of all, from the field mitigation, from a tenant's point of view, by and large, it, it worked. Uh, the fact that tenants are getting the help that they need. <coughs> but I think that mitigation is only a, a short-term short, uh, stopgap rather than a long-term solution. And it, we may be looking at a situation where the housing benefit is getting defaulted to this parliament. But if that's the case, I would argue that it's not who controls housing benefit that really matters. It's what we do with it. I think that housing benefit, housing benefit was introduced in 1982 primarily for two reasons because there was uh, variations in rent in the fire houses and there was uh, a need to bring rent relief into the welfare state. And we had the, the logical decision that it was brought under control of the Department of Work and Pensions. 
But that was like 30 years ago, and I would argue that the housing benefit experiment has failed. It's not, it's not meeting the objectives that it should have been. I would like to see, according to the Smith report, it looks as like if housing benefit is going to be devolved, and I support that transfer of powers. I would hope that I don't think there's much merit in the argument of if it is devolved, that it's under the control of a Scottish welfare minister. I think it does make more sense for it to be seen not as a benefit per se, but as a state subsidy on the demand side of the housing system to ensure fairness. And instead of being under the control of the Department of Work and Pension, being under the control of the, the housing minister. I think this would have two main effects. It would transform how we viewed housing benefit. It would no longer be seen as a, a subsidy for households on low incomes. It would be seen as a political and economic tool to ensure fairness in our housing system. But it would also make good practice in government sense, because 95% of the subsidies in housing is on demand side, yet the housing minister has no control over that. I think that we need to look at maybe a little bit long, long term to find out a a, a long-term solution to the bedding tax, and I think that, that would be that would be an option for us to, to change how we how we view and how we work with what, uh, what housing benefit when it comes up here. Yeah. Well, thanks for an interesting contribution. We're starting to get up against the clock, but if people want to comment on the wider aspect that Mr. Wiley's um, spoken about, or to respond to any of the points that, that colleagues made over the past two or three minutes. We've got three or four MSPs raising points, so if anybody wants to come back on any of, of those. No? The point that's been made in terms of the time scale until um, there's a longer term solution, whatever that may be, to some of the challenges that are, we are seeing in, in our communities and our tenants are fa facing in terms of meeting housing costs whether it be through the devolvement of powers and changes to our, our housing benefit system or our welfare reform system, then I think we need some shorter term assurities around the mitigation being in place so that for next year we can be planning and giving some certainty and some assurity to our tenants who are obviously concerned about what this might do to them uh, in terms of the shortfall for next year but also look at whether we can lessen the burden that's been placed on local authorities in terms of the administration process. We, are, we can make the system no simpler than we already have. We feel that we have regulations that we're having to work to in terms of, yes, someone must qualify for housing benefit, which is the first hurdle, and secondly, they have to apply or even give, as Cliff says, an intent to apply, and that places an administrative burden upon the councils uh, and local authorities who are, who are dealing with this issue. So in the short term, there are some things that are needed in terms of con confirmation, if it can be given about mitigation going forward um, in the short term, but also looking at the, the regulations and administration process. Can I just, I don't know if there's anyone else wanting to, to say anything. I promised uh, someone who was at the meeting yesterday that I would ask this question. Now, there might not be an answer to it. Um, it may be that we could write to local authorities to establish just how much this would cost. But the point that was made to me yesterday was that the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, uh, has written off the, the debts of those who refuse to pay the poll tax. And if there are any outstanding debts for those who can't pay, the bedroom tax, how much of an impact would that be on local authority budgets if, if there were to be a write-off of existing debts? Has that been considered? Would you have an idea of the number of people it would impact on and how much it would cost to do that? I think we'll have to write to local authorities to get that figure <laughs> looks at. <laughs> but I, I have fulfilled my commitment to ask that question, <laughs> which I promised I would do yesterday. Um, does anyone have any final comments that they want to make, something that, that they, they think should be addressed um, before we, we finish up? Uh, Claire? Um, one of the things that came out um, from the NIDRI meeting yesterday quite, quite um, vociferously was people's concerns about um, digital inclusion. And um, there was one lady whose only contact with the DWP to say that there was money coming was by text message to her mobile phone. And she's yet to, to understand exactly what payment she's getting and why. 
Um, and I just think that um, going forward, as more and more pressure is put on it, that digital inclusion has to be seen as a, as a social <coughs> right for people and a lifeline and, and, and not maybe then pushed into the luxury part of things because it's absolutely vital for people that, are, that have access to, to broadband and mobile phones in the current climate, especially the way the DUWP have pushed it. <laughs> Anyone else got a comment that they want to finish with? It's, it's just um, talking about the Smith Commission. I think um, there was a general agreement about the, the shift to of administrative powers to Holyrood, and obviously, uh, ideally, we would like that done as sooner rather than later. And if it can be done ahead of any primary legislation uh, on the devolution of, through uh, Section 30. Um, approval that obviously we would welcome that and I think everybody would welcome it if we could just get on and do it as um, it would ease the transition. Anna? Um, I just wanted to raise the point that of the, the 900 cases we've collected looking at the impact of welfare reform on children and families, almost 50% of them there's an issue with either misinformation um, or poor communication. Or, or maladministration more broadly. It's a massive issue and I think it needs to remain in the focus of the, the Welfare Reform Committee and also investment in information and advice to ensure that when there is miscommunication or maladministration that people are aware of it and can challenge um, DWP or local authority decisions. Anything else? Well, can I thank everyone who's come before us this morning? Again, this is an issue that we have paid close attention to in the past. We'll continue uh, to monitor how the, the process goes forward and as we look forward to the, the Smith Commission um, impact um, we will we'll keep a, a close eye on it and take on board all the points that have been raised and the questions that have been asked of us this morning. I think throughout this morning there was a two or three issues that, that came up that will require us to contact local authorities and get um, more information that would be helpful if we get that so that the clearer picture we have of what's happening out there uh, can be discussed as we as we look at the issues we move forward but I think it's been useful to, to have this session uh, to update ourselves on how things are moving forward in terms of the mitigation and what remains to be done uh, to address some of the the, the problems that, that still exist with whether they're bureaucratic administrative resource or whatever uh, these are things that we need to be aware of and we need to keep an eye on so thanks very much to you all for your your contributions and I'll suspend the meeting uh, before we have our next panel. Thank you.
Okay, our second right of business today is our first oral evidence session as part of our Women and Welfare Inquiry. Um, so I'd like to welcome our first panel on this subject. Um, we have Howard Reid, the Director of Landman Economics, previously Chief Economist to the Institute for Public Policy Research, Morag Gillespie, a Senior Research Fellow at Glasgow Caledonian University, Dr Helen Graham, Research Fellow at Edinburgh Napier University, and Professor Diane Elson, who is the Chair of the Women's Budget Group and Emeritus Professor at the University of Essex. Um, welcome to you all. Um, do you have statements that you want to make to kick off? Have anyone prepared anything or will we just go to questions? Professor? Perhaps I could just say uh, one or two things. First, in terms of thinking about women and welfare and why you've got a committee on women and welfare, I think two, two issues I'd like to bring out. One is the issue of the, the unpaid work of caring for families and communities, which both men and women participate in, but women do more of it and have more responsibility of it than men. And this makes a difference in the way that women interact with the welfare system. The other is what I call the, the wallet and the purse issue, which is the issue that it matters to, into whose whether it's to the wallet or to the purse, that the payments actually go. So although within the family, then, the, 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 uh, the money may be redistributed, who, whose hands it comes through, does it come to the, work, the wallet for men or the purse for women, makes a big difference to bargaining relationships uh, within households. Uh, and I think the third thing I'd like to say is I'd really encourage... Um, this committee and, and the Scottish Parliament, I think, has a wonderful opportunity to reframe how we think about these issues. And I'd like to see this issue framed in terms of social security, uh, social security that everybody needs at some uh, phases in their lives, because I think we've had a very divisive kind of discourse building up about um, those on welfare and those who are taxpayers. Actually, we're all taxpayers and we all have welfare benefits at some phases in our lives. So anything you can do to think of things in terms of developing a vision for social security as part of a, a decent society where everybody can live with dignity and where we can all contribute in different ways, whether it's through paid work, through unpaid caring work for our families and communities, and through volunteering work. So a system that encompasses all of that, I think you would be doing uh, a great service for people in Scotland and for the people in the UK in general. Okay. Can I kick off by making a, a, a comment? You'll be aware that this committee has uh, commissioned research in the past. Now, as someone who studied sociology, I'm aware of the phrase, and I've used it uh, before, that sociology is a, a complex explanation of the patently obvious, um, and that we've, <clears throat> we, we sort of suspected that the research would show us where rich area or better off areas would, would sit in, uh, in relation to more deprived areas as welfare rolls out. So I suppose there were no surprises there. What did, I think, impact on the committee was the scale of the, the impact, um, how much it was going to impact on individual people, and hence the reason why we're looking specifically mm -hmm. at women. Mm -hmm. But in the submissions, we, I saw the phrase used, a helicopter view, which I suppose is, mm -hmm. is, is that sort of same ideas as the, the complex explanations of the patently obvious. I suppose we know that if we had a helicopter view of, of this issue, there would already be things that we would expect to see. But could you all give us, an, uh, from your own perspective, what specifically we have to look at if we do take that helicopter view? Morag, do you want to have a go um, Yeah, well, I mean, I think I was a bit worried when I looked back with retrospect at my submission that it was really mostly about the helicopter view. But it seems to me that um, 
I find the term welfare, as Diane has just said, I find the term welfare not only unhelpful because of its pejorative meaning, particularly uh, when, you, when you look at uh, countries like the USA, um, but also because it's confusing. Because we all, every one of us, benefit hugely from the welfare state. And the welfare state includes all manner of different things which are... Uh, often universal services like education and health and child benefits and, you know, getting our streets cleaned and public, uh, you know, planning. All of those things are all part of the welfare state. Social security is one of the things that is part of the welfare state. So what I'm interested to see is how we can improve people's social security. And I, I, for me, I sometimes feel like I'm in a minority of one because everyone talks about welfare. But for me, that's what we should be aspiring to do, is seek to underpin people's lives with some social security when they need it. In order to do that, I think we need to look at the trade-offs, for example, between taxes and benefits. You will be aware from the submissions that when you have a recession, you can respond in two ways to the recession. You can bring in more money or you can cut benefits and services um, or you can do a mixture of the two, which is the more common thing. And it's the balance between those that determines who gains and who loses. What we've seen in this process in the UK is men gaining and women losing because men gain more from you know, g gifts through the taxation system and women lose because of the cuts in benefits um, and they don't gain so much from, the, from the, the, the tax gains. And other people can say much more about that. The point is that that principle is there. And for me, the other problem that there exists in a system which has been tinkered with for 60 years is that there are two areas for sure that I can think of where benefits are part of the problem. And what I mean by that is... Um, maybe more in the UK, but also in Scotland, we've used housing benefit as our response to um, unaffordable housing um, for people. Now, unfortunately for too many people in working in ordinary jobs, housing is unaffordable. And it seems to me, as one of your witnesses we heard saying in the previous session, was saying you actually need to look at the supply side of housing and whether tackling the cost of housing um, can be addressed. Either that or you need to have an economic strategy which, which doesn't create jobs which are minimum wage jobs, which is a high wage economy. You need to deal with one of those problems, not through the benefit system, um, to make housing affordable for ordinary people. It's not sustainable to be in a country where housing is not affordable for ordinary working people. And benefits can't... Paying benefits is simply going to potentially stoke the flames of that. And I'm not suggesting for a second that you stop paying those benefits, but that you actually work towards a different balance again in the system between supporting supply and demand side. And there are similar issues for childcare in looking at whether support for the supply side, as is, for example, the case in Sweden, would actually be more beneficial in the long run. So all of those things, tax, um, other social services um, um, and childcare training, um, minimum wage protection, all of those things need to be part of the context in which social security decisions are made. Mr. Reader, so you... Um, yeah, uh, um, I guess the thing about a helicopter <coughs> view that is, um, although you miss some of the detail by taking a kind of overall view of the cumulative impact of the, um, the cuts to benefits and tax credits over, the, say, the 2010 to 15 Parliament, um, it's quite important, I think, to, to measure the relative impact of each of the different reforms. Because, I mean, uh, with um, Laman Economics, in, in conjunction with National Institute for Economic and Social Research, did a big project for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, um, looking at cumulative impact of all the kind of changes to benefits over the 2010 to 15 period. And we found, I mean, it's, it's about, I think, about 21, 22 billion of, of, of cuts. Now, there's been a lot of focus on bedroom tax, and, and your, I saw your previous item as bedroom tax, and that's important to focus on that because it's, very, very, it's a very, very uh, damaging cut for people it impacts, as are things like the benefit cap, you know, restricting benefits to £500 a week maximum for families. But some of the... They're, they're nasty cuts, but some of the biggest impact are some of the things that have the least attention, like changes to uprating, for example, going from retail price index to consumer price index, which on average takes cuts benefits by 0.7% a year, 
doing that um, year on year. And so the cumulative impact of that is massive, um, as are all the big cuts to tax credits that kind of were, came through in 2011, 2012, 2013. Um, and also the even before universal credit has been rolled out, there's been quite big cuts to some elements of that, like the, some of which were meant to improve work incentives, like the disregards that people can, the amount people can earn before they go into the taper has been kind of cut several times before it's mainly been rolled out. So um, the nice thing about taking a kind of overall view is that you can, uh, you, you can assess um, all the benefit all, all the benefit changes and tax credit changes that you're able to. You can't quite do everything because the data isn't very good. Some of the disability things like personal independence payment is quite hard to actually model with the data we've got because we don't have enough information on how disabled people actually are. But the stuff you can do shows that there's, there's really big impacts and that it's, it's women who are kind of bearing the brunt of this. Depending on, what, depending on the precise um, definitions you use, it's either kind of two-thirds hitting women, one-thirds hitting men, or I've seen... I've seen analyses showing that 85% of the cuts are hitting women. Even so, there's, so whichever, whichever particular methodology you use, it's certainly dispro disproportionately impacting women. Not surprisingly, because uh, women receive the bulk of benefits and kind of family-related benefits and tax credits. So I actually, I mean, my, speci my specialism, if you like, is the kind of helicopter view. But within that, there's a whole host of things going on. So I think it's important to have both, really. Yeah. Dr. Graham. Um, I think if you look at welfare states across Europe, uh, the most successful um, in terms of gender equality and also more, more broadly in terms of, of poverty alleviation and quality of life more generally, um, they either support women's caring role or they take on some of that responsibility and facilitate their role as, as workers, as autonomous uh, adults. And the, the problem with the, the UK welfare system is that it doesn't really do either very effectively. Um, it places quite strong expectations on people to work, even people with quite intense caring responsibilities. But it doesn't really do enough to facilitate um, that participation uh, in terms of, uh, of childcare um, and, and, act and active labour market uh, policies. Uh, so I think um, there's maybe, you could maybe look to uh, countries that do this more successfully um, to kind of maybe see where the, where the UK is, is lacking. Uh, Professor Elson, do you want to comment on that specifically? Uh, um, I mean, just to say that um, I support the points that, that have been made. Um, uh, we both need the, the broad overview where we recognise the distinctive positioning of women and men because of their distinctive responsibilities in relation uh, to care and the way that men and women are raised still with stereotypes which affect the kind of work they go into in the labour market. And we also need uh, the detail about the individual uh, benefits, how they interact with one another and how they differentially impact on, on different groups. And here we're particularly thinking about how, how they differentially impact on uh, women and men. Okay, I've got an indication here from colleagues. So I'll ask a specific question. Uh, the, the contributions we had in writing referred to a greater attention being paid to employment support specifically. Um, and taking account of gender barriers, um, it would appear from reading more into those contributions that zero hour contracts are one of those gender barriers. How big is the differential in terms of women affected by zero-hour contracts? Is there any analysis of that, uh, Dr. Graham? Uh, yeah, 55% of zero-hour contracts are held by women. I suppose an argument, and I'm, I'm trying to be as, as fair as I can in, the, in terms of hearing it from the other side. We, um, we don't often do that in this committee, but I'm trying to be as fair as I possibly can. That women predominantly prefer to have the, fle the flexibility of zero contracts. Now, I can see more eggs going to come right in on top of that right away. So even in trying to be fair, uh, the answer's already coming towards me. Morag, do you want to respond to that point? As with many of these things, it's about balance because nobody, man or woman, wants to be sitting <clears throat> at home waiting to find out if they're going to get any work in order to pay the rent and the electricity bill this week. And the point about zero hours contract is that, that it needs to work in a, with a degree of flexibility on both sides. 
But I think the problem with the, the, there are an accumulation of problems around insecure employment. The TUC recently produced some information which pointed out that women are also disproportionately likely to be affected by short hours contracts. So where what the employers only guaranteeing very small numbers of hours. And one of the reasons for this is that this, one of the sectors where this is really getting quite, quite predominant is the retail sector. So it's not just zero hours contracts. Uh, you almost need to see as a symbol of insecure employment rather than the whole problem of insecure employment. And it is about balance. It's about employees and employees employers having some balance and, and having some, some rights to be able to earn a wage because when people try to claim benefits when they have zero hours contracts they face a real problem. Do you know, th this is really the ultimate route for exploitation if an employer chooses to deal with it that way. And yes, people do fine with zero hours contracts in some conditions, but that's only because they have employers who behave in a reasonable way and one can't make, we really can't make that assumption. Um, that employers will always behave in a reasonable and measured way. So I think that's why it's a problem. But women are disproportionately affected by that uh, and also insecure self-employment uh, um, because th there's been a huge rise in self-employment in Scotland. There's been a huge rise in self-employment amongst women and there's been a fall in income from self-employment. Now, I don't think these things are unassociated, although I haven't actually seen something which draws those together in a full and coherent way, but I suspect increasingly people are doing the jobs they used to do, but in a self-employed contractual basis, possibly, you know, for local authorities or health services or, you know, delivering canteen services where there used to be employees, etc., etc. Okay, that's the reason. Um, yeah, just a, just a couple of points on zero hours contracts. Um, there is an additional problem for people on zero hours contracts claiming universal credit kind of coming down the line, which is the, the start of um, what's called in-work conditionality, where people who are kind of working low numbers of hours, uh, most people claiming universal credit will be required to uh, look for work at least 30 hours a week or 35, I can't remember, on a regular basis, or they could face sanctions um, for not doing enough hours. Now, obviously, if you're on a zero hours contract, it might be very difficult to, to, to guarantee yourself 30 hours a week. It might be impossible in some circumstances. For self-employed people, it could be even worse because of the, um, the minimum income floor provision in universal credit, whereby you will be assessed as, as if your income is equal to 35 hours a week at minimum wage, even if you're earning way less than that. Um, there are some exemptions for people in the first year of running a business and things like that, but these are two of the most problematic aspects of the new system, I think. And DWP hasn't really addressed how it's going to how it's going to actually implement these. But we're probably going to find that out in the next, next year or two, I should think. Yeah. Professor? The issue of flexibility is very important, but I think we have to distinguish between the flexibility for, for people to combine earning a living with caring for their family and the flexibility that some employers want to vary the size of their labour force according to hourly fluctuations in demand, daily fluctuations in demand. And I think those are two very different kinds of flexibility. And I think the flexibility we want for a, a decent society where we have men and women living in equality and people living less stressed lives is the kind of flexibility that allows people, both men and women, to combine earning a living with taking care of their families. I mean, a good example would be what my, my son and his partner enjoy. My son works for a big NGO that has parental leave and allowed him to reduce his working uh, days to four a week when he became a father. My daughter works for a parliamentary committee in Westminster, which uh, meant she was a researcher, so she had a long maternity leave paid and then the possibility of taking further unpaid leave without uh, loss of seniority, and she will recommence her employment at the beginning of June. I mean, I think that's the decent kind of flexibility that we want, the kind of flexibility that's beneficial both to employer and to employee and creates the kind of society that we want where people can combine caring for their families and earning a living. But the kind of flexibilisation we're seeing in much of the labour market, as I think Howard and Morag have pointed out, 
is a kind of flexibility which actually makes it so difficult to do that. Because if you don't know what hours of work you're working a week, how can you organise your childcare or your care for your elderly, frail parents? It, it, it assumes those zero-hours contracts that you have no other responsibilities. And maybe this works for some people, young people who may not have any other responsibilities, to, to caring responsibilities, but for anybody with caring responsibilities, I think zero hours contracts is a disaster. Um, I, th I might also add that the way that childcare is subsidised for a lot of working parents um, in this country um, is, is also problematic if you have irregular uh, employment. Um, so you, you organise your childcare, you pay for it, and then you get the, the tax credits um, back to subsidise up to a certain proportion of that, which is fine if you have a, a steady job, a steady income, but if your hours and your income is changing a lot, um, that's more problematic and the tax credit system is not very um, responsive to changes in people's circumstances. It's quite cumbersome. Um, so um, a universal model of childcare that's available to all um, would... Um, would accommodate that better than the, than the system we, we have at the moment through the tax credit system. Okay, I'll open up to committee members what you can have to be followed by Claire. Thanks a lot. It's actually a follow on from the, the area in which you yourself began to explore, and it's uh, um, in, in their reports, I mean, in, in Gender and Barnardo said that innovation uh, is needed to diverge from existing employability models that replicate gender segregation in the labour market. I'm just wondering how you feel that, that could be done. To anyone who wishes to answer. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say something. I mean, one, sure. I, I've looked, I, I know uh, uh, a bit more about modern apprenticeship schemes and a, a, a little bit about employability services. Mm -hmm. And I think um, one of the difficulties um, with those schemes is the, the complexity of provision, even who's even got responsibility for making that decision can be a bit of a, a challenge to see, particularly in terms of apprenticeships, because one of the things we see about modern apprenticeships, for example, is that they tend to reinforce existing occupational um, gender segregation within the labour market. So there, there, there is work to be done, though, at different levels to try and tackle that, both with employers, but also with careers guidance uh, for young people at school, actually even raising young you know, children's expectations about what, what they might do in later life. And within employability service, the issues are the same, that, that people, people are, are, people, the inevitable journey that people seem to be on is, is not being challenged. But coming back to the points that Diane made about lack of flexibility with care, what women can often be left with is very little choice about where they work because they have to do what will accommodate their often more complicated lives because of the care responsibilities that they have. So, the, the, as Helen says, you know, a different approach to childcare has the potential to ease those pressures so that women can make choices in the, in the more free way that, that men often do because men are much less often burdened with, with some um, unpaid um, caring roles. So um, I, I, I do think there's actually, as with many of these problems, there's actually more than one place where the problem needs to be tackled. And it does, it includes education, it includes schools, it certainly includes careers, it includes skills development in Scotland, but also in employability services. Two things um, um, briefly. One is that we, we, see, we seem to have less... Uh, um, specialist support for lone parents and I think Helen might want to say more about that but also for example women survivors of domestic abuse who want to move towards work at some stage afterwards will probably need a lot more support than is available in the standard package of support the system has to be able to accommodate those kind of things to help people move forward and not simply work with the target numbers which means you work with the people who are closest to the labour market it is really important even, even financially for the country, for the public purse, it's important that, that the folk are helped to move forward even when they need extra support. I just want to comment on that issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire. Um, 
Thank you. Um, it, it's really a point that um, Professor Elson mentioned in her opening statement, and I, I just wondered if the panel had a feel of, of what effect the single household payment could have for women and families. As in the universal yes. credit system, this has been an area of concern, I think, for, for us in um, the women's budget group in, uh, in London, uh, submitting a lot of evidence to the parliamentary committees in Westminster that considered the various stages of the Welfare Reform Bill introducing universal credit. And I think many others I could see from the submissions uh, share the same concern, that if you concentrate... <coughs> what is it, six benefits are going to be concentrated into universal credit. At the moment, their pay can be paid to different people in a couple household. But in universal credit, it's going to be one person in a couple household. So there's a lot of concern about that. I mean, particularly concern about how that's going to affect, if, if that's primarily going to go to men, how that's going to affect women in abusive relationships who are going to find it harder to leave those relationships but also what it what it does in general to uh, the the caring sharing and bargaining that goes on within households because although when money comes into men's hands and to women's hands the, the wallet and the purse as I said there is of course sharing that goes on within households but there's also bargaining and different senses of entitlement and there's often a sense of entitlement well the money came in through me so I have more say on how to spend it so I think there's a lot of concern about this concentration into one payment once a month as well is another problem and if I'm not sure that we we were discussing exactly what the devolution responsibilities and, and, and uh, powers are going to be. But if there's any devolution of how universal credit can be administered in Scotland, I think that would be a number one thing to look at. Can you have a system where you don't make all the payments to one person once a month? Can there be some possibility, as there is with some of the tax credits, of of, uh, of designating who in the household, so or maybe some of it can go to the main carer, some of it can go to the person uh, to another person in the household, so some kind of splitting, and if there's no splitting possible, then designating it for the main carer. So if you could do something different uh, in terms of the way that universal credit is rolled out in terms of its administration on that point, I think that would be very valuable. The only thing I'd, I'd underline is that the, the, <coughs> the monthly payment in some cases may be a big problem, monthly in arrears, may be a big problem in terms of some people's actual ability to manage money over that longer time. I mean, the, re the stated reason for doing it was that it, it matches up with the way most people are kind of paid in the labour market. But for people on zero hours contracts, well, that may not be the case. You know, they may well be being paid week to week and so it would be better probably to have a you know have a flexibility where the claimant can choose you know how often they want the money paid i don't see why that why that would be a bad thing yeah. also for lots of people in low incomes the way you pay for things is, is weekly so people yeah. are, you know not even weekly you know if people are on a, a fuel card meter do you know do you, do you know their uh, meter card they're they're going to have to um, pay for that as and when so you know, at one, this is this is where our, the the strategies don't join up well because on the one hand we're, we're looking for people to to live quite hand to mouth, if you like, and lots of people do actually get paid weekly still or fortnightly, um, and um, they live like that. But on the other hand, we then want to to pretend almost that they're they are sort of white collar workers on their monthly salary, and it's it's not people, pe you know, lots of people's lives aren't quite that that tidy almost and I think we need to accommodate the, the differences there. There's, there are of course other problems with the way that universal credit is being designed and Howard has mentioned a couple of them but the, the disregards for second 
earners uh, and the way that um, the tapers have been designed means actually for all the, the rhetoric about universal credit is supposed to encourage people into employment, paid employment, for second earners in couple households, many of whom will be women and given the kind of low pay that uh, many women are likely to get, it actually won't be worth their while. Uh, uh, to financially uh, to take on a job because of the, the loss they'll get. And I think that this is completely at odds with the idea of we want everybody um, to be in the labour market and contrasts a lot with the regime for uh, lone parents, women who were lone parents, 95% or so of lone parents are women. There's every pressure now from the age when the children are quite young for them to take paid employment. But if you're a woman in a couple household under the universal credit system, actually the pressures may be in the opposite direction for you to not to take on paid work because um, there won't be a fi financial gain to speak of. And that, again, could be something if you have some kind of control over the details of the, the administration and design of universal credit in Scotland, that issue of the disregards for second earners and the extent to which there's a cutback on the universal credit as a second earner uh, earns more, um, you could perhaps make a difference there for people in Scotland. OK, Kevin. Convener, and I can maybe start with a point that uh, I brought up with the previous panel um, and in a letter to the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, <coughs> Neil Cooling, the Director General of Universal Credit, um, said that we believe the system is safe and secure. Do you think that Universal Credit is going to be safe and secure for women? Professor Elsa? <laughs> I think that, I, yes, I, I shake my head because I think there are so many question marks about that. It's clearly not going to be safe and secure for women who are at risk of um, abuse in abusive relationships. I think it's uh, not going to be secure for, for, for many women, even if they're not in abusive relationships, as money moves that they were getting in their hands moves away uh, from them. And, and there's going to be, have to be more bargaining within households about how that money is spent. It's going to be so much harder to budget, as Morag was pointing out, at the point that Howard was making about the uh, women who are self-employed. And we know, I think, that the the uh, low hour self-employment on very low earnings is disproportionately women. Uh, I don't think universal credit is going to be safe and secure for them. Morag? I, I, would, I would agree. I mean, I think everything we've all been saying suggests that there's, there's lots. The, uh, in essence, the principles of universal credit is not, it's not a completely bad thing. The notion of how it works, if you want to have a system of means-tested benefits, you know, there are principles that underpin universal credit that aren't necessarily bad. But then, like anything like this, the devil's in the detail, the taper rates, the specific rules that apply, how benefits are treated, what you disregard, what you don't disregard, all of that then becomes the detail that makes it um, problematic, I think. So, as it is just now, I, I, I think it's fraught with, with sort of bare chats for women. But one of the other things that that worries me, as well as the housing issues, which I think you were maybe uh, um, the housing benefit issues, which sure. you were discussing, and the long tail before Scotland is going to actually be able to have more control over the housing benefit element of universal credit is a problem because it, it delays the time before you can deal with that. So, so it would be wiser for us to control all elements of welfare here so that we can um, uh, tailor them to, to our needs and maybe get them a little bit better than the so-called safe and secure universal credit, which seems to me not to be safe and secure. Well, cer certainly, I suppose, what's, when you sit down and look at what's being devolved and the limits of the responsibilities, no, no, not the limits of the responsibilities, the limits of the powers to vary and change what's there, it seems to me to be very limited. So, um, yes, I would... I, I would, I would I would feel that, that there's much more scope for us to do more because of the other, because Scotland has 
the powers over other aspects which are crucial to a good integrated system that connects the different parts of people's sure. lives. So the housing, the childcare, um, the, the, the economic strategy, even the kind of jobs that are being created, and joining those up along with tax powers and um, the benefit system. It makes much more sense if they can, if they can integrate in an effective way that benefits women because um, that, in, in many senses, is the problem, that benefits changes are happening in a silo um, which is not taking account of the wider context that, in which people live their lives. And that, that has the, there's at least the potential then to do that. Um, I mean, on safety, if, if, if the, the, the guy who said that universal credit was safe and secure, if by safe he meant that it provided an adequate safety net in terms of minimum income that people couldn't fall below, then I think that's completely wrong for two reasons. One is that the, um, as the amounts of benefit in the existing system and also transferring over to universal credit are being cut in real terms with the 1% up rating and now there's going to be another two year freeze on working age benefits. It's, it's becoming increasingly impossible for, per, for people in, in receipt of benefits and tax credits to make ends meet um, because the amounts are just too low that they're receiving. And also there's a, there's a growing number of people falling through the system due to sanctioning. Uh, Oh, we know from statistics on job seekers allowance and employment support allowance that the number of sanctions uh, being given out per month has rocketed up since the, since the rules were revised in 2012. I've done some work for Oxfam which kind of looks at the effectiveness of sanctions and shows that they have no impact really in encouraging, in, in reducing unemployment. In fact, if anything, they increase the level of inactivity for the, uh, for the, 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 the claimant groups. Um, but those, that the universal credit is going to have an even more draconian sanctions regime than the existing JSA, ESA system. So we're going to get, I think, more, I fear, more and more people simply falling through the cracks and just, you know, disappearing off the radar of official statistics, potentially. So it is very worrying. Dr. Kian. Um I can't comment on the cyber security of the, uh, of the computer system at the moment, um, obviously, but... Um, the, my understanding is that the IT system on which universal credit is based is pretty much in disarray. And it's, what it's trying to do is extremely complicated to bring in all kinds of uh, real-time information from different sources. Um, and I'd say maybe if the, if the Scottish Government wants to take, take that on, maybe they should be careful what they wish for. Um. I, I don't think it was just uh, the IT systems that uh, Mr Cooling was suggesting were safe and secure. Um, uh, I don't know if, if you've come across Mr Cooling, but uh, previously uh, I said he lived in Clyde Cuckoo Land, and uh, I think this is a, another example of, uh, of the strangeness of his opinions. You don't no. have to. <laughs> I, 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 it was more rhetorical. I, I, can, I wonder if I could change tack um, ever so slightly. We've got situations where many women have got uh, caring responsibilities which... Uh, involve young folk and, and old folk at the same time, and uh, it's been referred to as sandwich carers by a number of people. Um, I, I know some folks in that position who um, have employment where they've got a fixed amount of hours um, and their employers are flexible in terms of when they work that hours. So basically the employer fits in with the needs of the employee. Um, I recognise that that's extremely rare, um, but has there been any analysis done on the benefits to employers to allow that level of fl flexibility um, so that um, all of these responsibilities can, can be done at the same time? The kinds of benefits that there are to employers are th things certainly like retention, of staff in which an employer has invested uh, training and time and so forth. The retention of staff, of staff who've got firm specific skills, who know about that particular business. Um, so retention of skilled staff is a very important benefit, I think. Um, uh, staff who are more um, 
enthusiastic, who are more committed, who when they are at the workplace can, uh, can concentrate on the work because they know that they've been able uh, to have that flexibility in terms of hours for uh, dealing with their, their care commitments. And I think that kind of strategy of employers is really part of a, a, a way of uh, looking at an economy in terms of creating a high skilled, high productivity economy that believes in investing in your employees. And as I see that kind of flexible hours arrangement that you mentioned as, as another kind of investment mm -hmm. uh, in employees and in their, their productivity, their retention, their enthusiasm. I, I, is, has there been any major analysis done on that at all to, to look at the entire benefit to? to the individuals and to society as a whole, allowing that flexibility? I'm not, I'm not aware of any. It's possible that, that there has been some research on that. I mean, I, I'm currently engaged in um, building a model of the, um, the English social care system. We did one for Wales a few, a few years back, which looks at the impact of... This is a slightly different area, but looks at the impact of different funding packages for um, social care, domiciliary and residential on sort of um, the income distribution and uh, employment levels. Uh, so there's a little bit of, in, in terms of people going into work when they're also trying to care for relatives, um, that there's a little bit of that in there. But it's not, it's not as specifically targeted at that specific question you had as, uh, as, it, as, 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 you know, as would be most useful. And it, 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 it would be good to see more work on, the, on, on that kind of area. I agree. What I, what I would suggest, though, is that what to look at is the wider implications yeah. of, of that issue and tackling it. And I think it's Norway which actually delivers sandwich care services. So you, there, are, there are, are, are facilities which have both elder and child care facilities um, in order to, you know, in recognition of those issues as well as other wider socio good sociological reasons for, for having those, those kind of services integrated um, together. So I would look at the wider implications and look uh, Nordic for the, um, for, you know, for some ideas of, of what practice might actually um, make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Supplementary from Claire before I go to Christina. It was just a, a, a quick question in, in a relation to the idea of the push and pull effect of certain um, of the benefits on, on, on women, depending on the circumstances. <coughs> and I wondered if you, you thought that carers' allowance should be raised to the same level as job seekers' allowance, and if that would help. <laughs> yes. Uh, sure. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Graham wants to comment on that thing. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty fundamental. Um, I think it shows how how little the system values care that it's the lowest of any income replacement benefit. And in effect, those who are claiming carers' allowance, it's because they're caring at least 35 hours a week. So they are effectively unable to work because of a disability. It's not their disability, but it's someone's disability. Um, so if, en if anything, from a, from a sort of valuing care perspective, it should be set at similar levels to, to employment support allowance. What is slightly worrying, though, is, is I was reading in one of the papers about the um, devolution for the powers bill, a submission from CPAG to the committee, I think, raise it, and I think in gender submission also raises a concern that it would look as if the carers, the limits on the, what, what can be done about carers allows, would appear as if they're going to prevent um, you from giving people carers allowance who are maybe in part-time work or, or part-time study, um, which I think is a bit disappointing as well, because the notion that you're either a carer or you're in full-time work or you're in full-time education, again, doesn't reflect the reality of people's lives, even if it is administratively convenient. You know, it, it's, you know I'd, so it would be disappointing if there's not, we're not able to accommodate some flexibility yeah. there. So that variation of the 35 hours a week rule would be important if you can possibly do that because there are people who are providing care to people who need care, not for 55, uh, or, or they're part of a, a, a care package, uh, who, who may be a student um, or who maybe have a, a part-time job and they couldn't get carer's allowance under the current rules. 
Christina. Oh, thank you very, very much, convener. And I just wanted to pick up some of the, the <coughs> points that, that you, you've all raised this morning, and there's a number of things. I wanted to go back to the issue about lone parents, and one of the other things that I wanted to uh, get some of your thoughts on is, is this um, preponderance that the welfare system has got on um, putting people into silos and, like, you're a lone parent or you're fleeing domestic violence or you're a carer. Now, I've got somebody on my caseload right now who is a lone parent, fleeing domestic violence, has a disability and has a caring responsibility for a child. All of them. You know, and to try and deal with that whole complicated, you know, my asthma of, of benefits, entitlement and everything has is, been very, very difficult. Indeed, the impact that that person has had then had has a sanction. And I wanted to get some of your, your thoughts on sanctions and the impact of sanctions because it seemed to me a few years ago the benefits agency dwp were less likely to apply sanctions to lone parents and that seems to have reversed now that you're getting many many more lone parents who are facing sanctions and the impact that's then having on them but also alongside that is the increasing children and young people and the parents of those children accessing food banks um, it, you know, you can't separate a, any of this at all. And I wondered whether, you know, um, Professor Elson, you produced a very, uh, and a very supportive of it, a very interesting document called Plan F, which was a, a budget, you know, for, for a feminist budget for, for looking at all of these things, and whether you can give us some insight into how you think, you know, we should be applying, you know, some of these um, very um, intuitive ideas mm -hmm. to to again, you know, create a welfare system, as I said in the last panel, a welfare system that actually meets the need of the individual who are accessing it. Well, thank you for mentioning this uh, plan. We called it Plan F because people were talking about Plan A, which is the government's plan, and then some people in the opposition were talking about Plan B, and we said Plan F, a feminist plan. And it was developed jointly, the Scottish Women's Budget Group, Morag and her colleagues, and the uh, UK Women's Budget Group in London. And I think the main <coughs> thing that's relevant for this committee is we, we wanted to position Social Security as part of this... This, uh, this broader plan for investment in a uh, caring and a sustainable economy. And to see the money that's spent on social security and on education and on health and on social housing and so forth as an investment in our people and in our future. And I think the kind of joined up, uh, joined up thinking about that is, 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 uh, is part and parcel of what we'd like to see. And, and you, the case you've given us shows us where there isn't joined up thinking, where because, and I'm sure uh, other people want to comment on this, because of the sanctions regime driven by the wish to reduce the numbers on the books getting job seekers allowance and the money that's spent on job seekers allowance, uh, so that that um, that drive for sanctions actually drives people to food banks. I mean, the impact this is having on the the health and well-being of children, on the health and well-being of the lone parents, mainly mothers who are who are in that situation, isn't factored in at all. But of course, this is going to create costs for the health service, for the education service, maybe for the. Uh, the crime prevention and justice systems. Would you then suggest that the UK government should apply an accumulative, uh, an accumulative impact assessment on all of these changes to the welfare system? Is that something you would support? Yes, yes. and I think it's something that Howard has been one of the pioneers of, uh, of doing, of factoring in all of these different changes so you can see what they all add up to. Yeah, I mean, in, in as much as we're able to with the data, one of the problems with sanctions is that it's quite... Using the kind of techniques that um, Lamb and Economics use to model the cumulative impact of, of um, changes to benefit rates and um, tax cuts, etc., um, it's quite hard to apply that approach to sanctions because you don't have information in the kind of survey data that we use to model those changes doesn't Some show sense. you whether people have been sanctioned or not. Um, and in fact, the statistics and the sanctions, there, there's fairly good statistics on the number of sanctions being given out and broken down by lone parents, childless people and by age, etc. Uh, and by whether it's JSA or ESA. But the statistics on what happens to people after they're sanctioned are almost non-existent. 
and statistics on the implications of sanctions for people's, uh, you know, for people's spending, uh, use of food banks and sanctions. There just aren't any, really. Um, the coalition government, as was, didn't really seem to be interested in producing that kind of data. Um, and so I think that is a huge problem, and we're kind of... Uh, we're rather kind of flying blind at the moment. I mean, we know there's going to be adverse impacts of the increased use of sanctions, but we don't know the real magnitude of that. And as I say, it's a problem that's only going to get worse as universal credit is rolled out under the current rules. So would you think that, given there's a new government in place and, and you know, the, the Prime Minister yesterday did say that, you know, he was going to be an open government, he's going to work very hard for everybody in the UK, do you think that then an immediate review of the conditionality aspects of universal credit and the whole system needs, needs pressure applied to it? And is that something, you know, that, that, that we can do from here and you can do from all of your respective organisations? Oh, well, I would say definitely. I think that's a really good idea. Um, and also getting more clarification on how aspects of this are actually going to work. Like, how is in-work conditionality actually going to work in practice? How is the self-employment, how are the self-employed rules going to work in practice? Because a lot of this has just been kind of kicked down the road at the moment. And when Universal Credit, uh, when they started putting people onto it, and I think 2013 or 14, it was only the, the easiest cases in inverted commas that were put on, and a lot of the self-employed weren't moved over. So now the government's in a position where it's going to have to confront these operational issues if it's going to be able to roll out the benefit um, en masse. So I absolutely, yeah, I think that would be a really good idea, calling for review at this stage. Would, would that be something this committee could take forward, convener? Can, can I add, add we are going a to comment? A report. I think that may be something we could look in at. relation to women in in, in reference to this, because <coughs> even if there are marginally more sanctions against men than women, I think it's marginal, but there are, are marginally more against men. What we do know over the years from studies, that, that one or two that have been done here, but work done by people like Jan Pal, is that, uh, about how people spend their money, how people use their money, suggests that women, even if they're not the people being sanctioned, may end up paying for those sanctions, because everyone who's sanctioned, who's not moving into a job, um, you know, as Howard has already identified, is, is kind of almost more likely to happen than um, in areas where sanctions aren't applied so heavily. Um, they are then being supported by other people. Who are those other people? Uh, you, we may need more research, to, but, but my guess from existing research is that it will be mums and siblings and aunties and people like that who are, who are giving up their own resources. So the wider implications, the deepening of poverty from sanctions is actually going to be spread through communities and not just affect the individuals immediately affected. So I think understanding those wider implications Applications will be important. And it goes hand in hand with that wider point that Dan was making about the cost, the implications for public services for the welfare state more widely, which people like the Equality Trust have, have highlighted quite effectively as well, although not in a very gender specific way, but they, they've highlighted the cost to public services of inequality. Um, and, you know, this is a good example. <coughs> Yeah, one, one, one further point about the conditionality. I think I'm right on this. Other people will correct me if I'm not. But I think under universal credit, one payment to, to one bank account in the household per month, conditionality that a, the a male partner fails to comply with will result in the withdrawal of that benefit and it will impact on, on the living conditions of the women even though she, it's not her that's not complying with the conditionality. So I think that's also a problem with the design of universal credit. And it's not impossible, I think, to, to revise these things. I mean, these are things about how, how the system is being designed in terms of conditionality, sanctions, how the payments are made, to who they're made, how they treat self-employed people. They're all things that could be uh, revised and reformed uh, without denying the basic principle, which I think is a good one, of trying to simplify uh, the benefits system. So... I think pressing on, 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 and those problems will become more apparent as the system starts to roll out. So Howard's point about actually the, there is no follow-up data about what happens to people who've been sanctioned. I mean, maybe this is something you could do here in Scotland. You, Scottish government could 
uh, set up a system of tracking people who have been uh, sanctioned um, and denied their benefits, you know, to find out what happens to them and who's bearing the costs of that, uh, how it's spilling over onto other relatives, onto children, onto other public services, so that you, you can then show very clearly the, um, all the negative externalities, as economists would call it, uh, of, these, of this uh, kind of very narrowly focused sanctions regime with one aim in in mind, really, which is to reduce the numbers getting these benefits and the benefit bill. It's a poverty ripple effect, then. Yeah. 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 Thanks, yeah. convener. Margaret. Thank you. Yeah, just staying on sanctions, the, has there any research been done just to establish how many women have been sanctioned because they're, you know, they were kept late from attending an appointment because of care responsibilities and you know because very often you know you may have your appointment when the child's in school or whatever but then the child could be sick and you know you, you can't keep that appointment I just wonder if there's any um, information on that the, uh, the, the, official... the statistics that the, the UK government puts out on sanctions um, give some information on the reason why uh, people in different groups were sanctioned, but I don't think the information in those statistics is detailed enough to enable you to identify specifically mm -hmm. people who didn't attend the appointment because of caring responsibilities. And because of the because the UK kind of household data sets like Family Resources Survey or the Labour Force Survey don't have information on who's being sanctioned, you can't use those as an alternative source of data to answer the question that you've just put. So uh, I, I think there's, there's some qualitative research with uh, individ you know, specific individuals who've been sanctioned, but there's very little information on how big a problem that is in the whole UK or in Scotland, like how many people that problem, that specific sanctioning problem relates to. So I think that is a gap in the uh, empirical evidence because we just don't have the data at the moment. The, the Fawcett Society's um, recent uh, study on, on job seekers' allowance and, and sanctions and its impact on women. And I think some of the groups that work particularly with lone parents, single parent action uh, network, one and probably one Scotland parent family is, Scotland is and so forth, who've done quite a bit of work on the, the impact of the sanctions regime on lone parents. And I think there are quite a lot of examples. Of, of this problem, that the way that the system is set up just takes no account at all of the caring responsibilities of lone parents. What we lack is what Howard mentioned, is the sort of the overall big data set for the UK as a whole to, to be able to say, these aren't just isolated cases. This is a quite typical thing that happens. So I think, again, pressing for more information on, on the these dimensions of sanctions regimes important. Advice agencies are also a good source of, it, of information about that as well because Child Poverty Action Group are doing are running a, a sort of early warning system where they're pick, picking up in case studies but also the Citizens Advice Network are, record data about their uh, inquiries relating to benefits fairly systematically so they may have the potential to gather more specific information. I don't know, you, you, you might need to ask them, but these are sources of information which are more, you know, it's, it's terribly easy for, for, for when you mention a case study for that to be dismissed as an anomaly or something that's unusual or rare. But, you know, when significant uh, numbers of people are needing advice with the same problems, it, it does start to, to be evidence that's given more weight. I, as a qualitative researcher, I don't think it necessarily, you know, it necessarily needs to be large numbers to give um, to give weight. But unfortunately, that's often the way people look at it. So, advice services might be a good source of information. Um, Dr. I think one of the, the wider impacts of the sanctions regime, as well, is that it, it potentially affects a lot of people through the fear of sanction. Um, so even if um, if lone parents are not actually receiving a sanction, it's the threat every time that they go to the job centre, am I going to be sanctioned this time? Um, that potentially affects all, all lone parents. So in that, in that sense, that's a kind of a wide 
impact of the sanctions regime that maybe isn't um, widely um, thought about when we think about the impact of sanctions. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about the universal credits, and I can remember when it was at the sort of rollout stage and there was still consultation going on. I'm sure there was discussion around and uh, recommendations made that if there was domestic abuse in a household, uh, the universal credit would be paid differently or to the women or a different split. And, and also on the, the timing of it as well, uh, if, if there were extenuating circumstances, instead of it being paid monthly, it could be paid two weekly. Is that actually happening? I don't think we know yet because the system has only been rolled out for uh, largely for, for single adults without children. Um, and I think there's a worry that although there are these phrases about extenuating circumstances and ability to, to make uh, claims for changes, the people who would, might want to claim all these extenuating circumstances are in a very vulnerable situation and are not best placed to deal with the complexities on, and bureaucracy. And especially if they've got to fill in, what is it? You've got to go online and, mm. and uh, fill in a long, a long a form about their changed circumstances. So I think there's a lot of worry that this won't be actually proved to be right. either feasible or adequate. Uh -huh. <laughs> and around the domestic abuse then, there's no evidence of that yet then because it's... I think we, because we haven't that. seen a rollout for right. many people yet, and it's mainly been single people without children. So all the difficulties we've been, many of the difficulties we've been talking about are, are ones that will occur in the future if they don't make any, if no change is made in the design of the system, but not ones that we can say is happening right now because mm -hmm. they haven't rolled it out to those, to, to most people. It's only a minority of people, the easiest cases. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, if we just go on to care allowances has been mentioned now and I, certainly I was at Nidri yesterday as well and uh, what did come up was if, for example, the Scottish Government was to increase a benefit that has uh, devolved powers over care allowance, for example, that would then mean that the universal credit would be reduced by that amount? Is that... that was... So you're not actually going to gain anything? That's an interesting question because depending on what exactly it is that's done, that, that yes, as, as with those divisions of benefits, yes, I think um, there are potentially some, some areas of difficulty with that. Seems to me, though, that's one of the reasons you need to look, take the helicopter view a bit more and not just operate... Um, within a benefit system where the UK government is making all, making all the rules and potentially benefiting from, from you know, wh wh why would you invest in, in increasing a benefit for someone if, if the only benefit was that the universal credit payment reduced and you saved the UK Treasury some money? Mm -hmm. So, to me, it, it seems that you need to start thinking a bit strategically about this. And I, one of the things I thought was that it will be important that this committee is also talking to the committee that's looking at the, the devolved powers bill. Yeah. So, that, so oh, right, I thought you would be, but... I just thought I'd mention it just in case. <laughs> but, do you know, I, th I think you need to be talking there. And it seems to me that housing <coughs> benefit is one of the areas where, OK, not immediately, but in the long run, you can actually do something different. But it seems to me that you also want to look at whether you can reduce the cost of housing in the first place for people to make them affordable for ordinary people because we, we, just, we just have a huge problem until we solve that. We have to be able to have a society where people can afford to live in a home. <laughs> you know? And, it's, and it, that's becoming increasingly questionable. And I would have to say, though, that one of the first things I did in the early days of being director of the Scottish Low Pay Unit in the 1990s when we campaigned for the national minimum wage, one of the first things I did was wrote an article for Housing Monitor for the Federation of Housing Associations about the seemingly intractable problem of low pay and affordable housing. And we've never moved on a jot in tackling that problem in the last 30 years, you know, which is really depressing. Um, um, so... I, I think you have to be smart about where you where you act. 
so as not to so as not to have that effect, so that people actually get the benefit and the money do, doesn't just get swallowed up the, by the UK government. I think you identified a particular issue of a broader problem that we'd actually been discussing as we waited, which is the, in the complexity of the, of, the div, of the devolved system and its interaction with the UK-wide system that seems to be emerging, you're going to have to look at the impact of any particular measure, both on the Scottish budget and on the UK budget, mm. on things like another example we had was, well, maybe, you know, one problem we say there's a lot of in-work poverty and couldn't this be... Uh, re reduced, and indeed the, the bill for tax credits and then universal credit, if people paid a living wage. And if you had a policy in Scotland of uh, introducing a living wage in all of the public sector and in public sector procurement, that would be good for people in Scotland, but the benefits bill that it would be reduced was not your benefits bill, <laughs> the Scottish Government, but the benefits bill for the UK Government as things seem to stand at the moment. So it does look as if you will need to, to, to look at those issues on whose budgets will the costs and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and savings fall of any particular measure, which is a problem because some of the things you might want to do would be very beneficial for the Scottish people. Uh, but that issue of is it the Scottish budget or the UK budget that get, gets the costs or the savings is, is going to be one to consider. Thank you. Thanks. Claire, you wanted to ask a supplementary before we finish. Yeah, it's moved on a wee bit. It was actually back to the, the discussion about sanctions. And um, excuse <coughs> me if I have picked you up wrong, Professor Ellison, but you were suggesting that we all know that the sanctions regime is about reducing the benefits payments cost. And that, you know, that, that was a general understanding. However, what we're told officially by the UK government is it's nothing to do with the targets, it's nothing to do with reducing that benefit bill, it's absolutely about a mechanism to move people into employment and I just wondered what you, um, if you knew of any research or was there anything there that showed that it did anything to improve people's employment? I've actually undertaken research on that, that, um, that uh, particular point. I did some research last year for Oxfam, um, trying to test, what, what we were trying to do is um, looking at the UK across Job Centre Plus districts, and there's about 45 districts, um, looking at whether there's a relationship between the, the proportion of JSA claimants in each district who were subject to sanctions in a given period, um, and whether the employment rate within that Job Centre Plus district uh, increased, uh, you know, uh, just after the, the sanctions were applied, or whether unemployment fell, or whether something happened to inactivity, you know, people who are neither employed nor unemployed but aren't even in the, aren't in the labour market. What the research found was that there was, no there was essentially no relationship between employment rate or, or unemployment rate and sanctions. So areas where sanctions were applied uh, with, with, with more gusto, shall we say, had no, seemed to experience no benefit in terms of lower unemployment, um, employment rates, I think, were, if anything, slightly lower in those areas, and inactivity rates were slightly higher. Uh, that was the main finding. So it seems that, if anything, uh, more kind of um, uh, wider application of sanctions um, is, is actually kind of driving people out of the system entirely. Now, it wasn't a very strong correlation, so I wouldn't want to put all my eggs in that basket, but certainly there was no evidence for the government's contention that um, you know, uh, this is a kind of uh, measure that's helping people into work. Um, I'd like, as I say, that the lack of good individual data on what happens to people after sanctions, after they're sanctioned, is what stopped me from doing a more detailed analysis at the individual level, which I'd ideally like to do if the data were there. Um, so this was the best I could do at kind of area level. Um, but as far as I was able to tell, there's no kind of beneficial impact of, of a more draconian sanctions regime. Um, and, and would you ag agree that any saving in terms of benefit and to the DWP from a sanction just pushes the societal responsibility onto the third sector and to local authorities in terms of hardship payments when that happens? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, that, that, that's true. And I think to the extent there is some research on this that has tried to look at... Um, uh, I'm pretty sure I read something from one of the... I can't remember what it was, but there was something that... Um, one, the Scottish Parliament had actually had, had um, 
commissioned some research on this or something like that, and um, they found there was uh, a kind of knock-on impact on things like um, health and social care services um, and other aspects of kind of um, the kind of hardship payments, etc., and more greater use of food banks. So I think, yeah, I think it does. You know, whilst you may see reduction in the overall upfront benefits bill, you're kind of pushing you're pushing the problem into other areas, which may mean that you know, it increases expenditure and increases need overall. Um, yeah. It's also pushing the costs out to a wider network of people. That, you know, I, I, I suspect that the, the thing that's happening is that extended families or pe other friends, people within communities are helping to bear the cost of that. And certainly the whole burgeoning of food banks and the, and the connection with maladministration of benefits and, and sanctions means that, that the community is, is trying to, sh to pick up the pieces, if you like, of what's going wrong for people either through sanctions or, or through poor, you know, lack of benefits payments and so on. So the wider community is paying for that. And in the long run, I think there's a, there's a, a knock-on effect of that in services as well. And the wider population health is, is what we, do, we, we can't tell until the damage is done almost is what it really is, is uh, in any detail is the implications for health of all of this. Thank you. And just to pick up that <coughs> important point you made about fear, I, I think that we've, we've now, people are afraid of the job centre. They don't see job seekers' allowance as a right because they're not encouraged to see it as a right. They're not treated with dignity. And I just see the contrast between when I was young and unemployed for a period and the way I was treated, uh, the dole, as we used to call it, uh, and the, the, the office you went to. And they, you know, there was, they were very supportive and helpful and there was no sense in which it was a shameful thing to go there. And the, the utter change in that notion of, of, uh, of, of benefits for people who are unemployed as, as uh, something which should be, which should treat people uh, with right, as having rights and treat them with dignity to something which stigmatizes them and puts them in fear, I think is a very bad change. And if there's anything you can do in Scotland in terms of the way that things like Job Seekers Allowance or then Universal Credit in future are administered to make it a less fearful, less shaming, less rights and dignity denying process. Again, I think that, that even if there's no change in the money, uh, that human dimension of the way that people interact with the social security system, would, if you can do anything to change that, would be really good. Yeah, we have heard evidence before from people who have come uh, to tell us about their experiences of the, yeah. the system who have confirmed exactly what you have said, yeah. that they feel as though by going for an interview that the person is trying to trip them up, catch them out, get them off the benefit rather than actually support them back into work or give them the support that they need uh, in the circumstances that they find themselves. So that, that chimes exactly with the evidence that we have heard and we have included that type of uh, stuff in the the reports that we've done previously and we'll continue to, to press that issue because it is a, a major concern, this wider mm. sense that the system's no longer there to support people, it's there to catch people out and to yeah. uh, prevent them from getting the support that they're looking for. And I think that's a, a material shift in, in the whole process, which is just unacceptable to the, this committee. Um, we've exhausted questions from members. If our witnesses want to conclude by just commenting generally on the, the, the situation from their perspective or direct us to where you think we should look further uh, in relation to this issue that we're investigating currently, that would be helpful. And if there's anything when you leave here in terms of your own work or work that you know that's, that's been undertaken that you could point us in the direction of, that would be most welcome. But I'll, I'll allow you to make any final comments before we, we close the meeting. It's up to yourselves. Well, can, can I speak as an English person who feels very privileged to have been uh, allowed to come and give evidence to this committee and say if there's anything you in Scotland can do uh, to, to sort of show the way forward for a more humane social security system which actually recognises that under human rights treaties there's a right to social security and reverses these changes in terms of 
shaming people and denying their dignity. If there's anything you can do here, that would be wonderful, because we can then say as we struggle about this in England, but look, it's not impossible. Look, they've made these changes in Scotland and they can sh show that it doesn't have to be like that. So that's my, that's my plea to members of the Scottish Parliament, I think, to sort of try and um, point the way forward to a better system in which we think about this as a social security to which we all have a right and are all treated with dignity. I think I, I, would, I, I, would, I would agree that, that, that in Scotland we need to, that, to strive to do that as much as we can. And I think what I would add to that is in whatever we do, it's going to be really important that we do equality impact assessment of things before they're done. So we think about it before we do it uh, uh, and then go, oh, no, we should have thought of that one. We should have seen that one coming, that, which happens to us all. But, you know, if you systematically think about what are the implications of this for women, for disabled people, for, for, for people who, who don't have full citizenship status, you know, and all those kinds of things, then you can start to understand what are the, the what curveballs are going to come in and hit you very quickly in wh whatever it is you're going to do. And I think I would also think if you, as you're looking at women and uh, um, social security. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> note the words, please. <laughs> social security. Um, I, I would like people in Scotland to have social security. Um, when you're looking at that, if you can encourage others to, to, to recognise the importance of understanding the gender implications, for all the reasons that we've discussed here, can I just give you a daft example of, of where I think people gather data and then don't look at it? There are Scottish welfare reform statistics. They don't say a lot. They don't tell us a lot about women and men and about gender. That could improve. The one area there is information about gender is in relation to the age and, and sex of children. Right, who in families who've, who've got benefits. And it would appear that the families getting financial support through uh, the Scottish Welfare Fund are far more likely or have far more boy children than girl children. It's 50 odd, you know, 56 or 57 percent compared to 40 odd percent girls. Now, there's either something really weird going on in Scotland or there's something wrong with somebody's statistical gathering. But my point is. That's been repeated through the quarterly statistics for a year and nobody's noticed. There's, there are good reasons for gathering disaggregated information by sex, but it's actually to consider the gender implications of the issue that you're looking at, whatever that may be. But there's clearly something... I've only just noticed it in looking at the stats for coming here, but there's something weird going on there, but I suspect it's probably a statistical gathering problem. Um, because there are, yes, marginally more boys than girls in, in our society, but not that many more, you know. So, you know, just actually, it's, it's about gathering data, but it's actually about using it as well so that, so that you can say, well, what are the implications of this? And, and people need to stop and think. Don't just gather the data. What does it, you know, what is it telling us? Um, just one point, really, uh, to underline Morag's point about um, equality impact assessment, which I think is, we haven't talked much about it today, but assessment of um, kind of putative reforms, as well as reforms that have recently been undertaken, kind of impact assessment, is really important. And um, it's worth looking at the, the guidance that the Equality and Human Rights Commission has put out on this, and they've critiqued a lot of what the UK Treasury has done, or hasn't done, on gender impact assessment. And... Um, yeah, they've, they've, they've got some really good material, and it was certainly worth talking to people from EHRC about what the best practice is in, in this area and how to kind of, you know, how to improve assessments, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd just say that the, much of the way in which welfare has a differential impact on women comes through the way that care is, is unequally distributed among men and women. Um, and I think in a system that's become very polarised um, between... Um, sort of strivers and, and shirkers. There's a danger that those who are um, performing unpaid care work are starting to be lumped in with, with the latter category, starting to be considered not to be um, striving in the same way as people in work. And I think that's, that's quite dangerous. And I think the system needs to, to recognise and value not just the intrinsic value of care, but also the instrumental value and the saving to uh, effectively the government of people performing care that they would otherwise have to, to pay for. 
Well, thank you very much to you all for your, your time and your contribution this morning, and we'll, we'll draw heavily on uh, the suggestions that you've made as we, we move forward, and thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll close the meeting by pointing out that our next meeting will be on the 2nd of June, where we'll continue to take evidence on our women and social security inquiry. <laughs> <laughs>